I stepped into the chilly forest in Humboldt County, California, accompanied by the sounds of my heavy breath and boots crunching dry leaves and twigs. My name is Ernest Coleman, a skilled hunter, and my sole focus today was tracking down a ten-point buck that had eluded me for days. A faint creaking above caught my attention branches swayed unnaturally. I knew this place like the back of my hand, but something didn't seem right. I tried to brush off those thoughts, thinking it was just pre-hunt nerves. Having been raised by a single father, hunting was always our bonding activity. It provided a much-needed distraction from the demands of our everyday existence. As I walked deeper into the woods, uneasy laughter echoed nearby. The sound sent chills down my spine. People? In these parts? Shrugging it off as a possible coincidence, I continued onward. A sudden rustling near a bush caught my attention. I approached cautiously when suddenly, a man stumbled out from behind it. Please! You gotta help me! He wheezed, out of breath, as if he'd been running for hours. There's something in these woods. The terror in his eyes seemed genuine enough. What's after you? I asked skeptically. I don't know what it is, he answered frantic. It's not human. It attacked and took my buddy. With a mix of curiosity and caution pushing me forward, we retraced his terrified steps. Jagged claw marks gouged the trees higher than any bear could reach. It was puzzling. We stumbled upon an abandoned campsite littered with shredded equipment. The smell of coppery blood hung in the air. Remains were strewn around like discarded dolls. As an experienced hunter, I couldn't imagine any creature capable of this savagery. Fanatical whisperings about an unknown beast floated through my mind but I tried to focus on more plausible explanations. After all, these woods were my territory, and nothing had ever scared me like this before. We continued cautiously, seeking answers. More claw marks appeared, each scarier than the last. Were they a warning or a taunt from this mysterious creature? Time seemed to lose all meaning as we ventured further into the darkening forest. Suddenly, an unmistakable growl reverberated around us. We froze, trying to pinpoint its source. The underbrush rustled again, and a hulking figure emerged from the shadows. It was an ungodly mix of man and beast muscular limbs ended in wicked claws. Its snarling mouth showcased rows of razor-sharp teeth. Its eyes bore into our souls with relentless hunger. The creature before us snorted with fury, dripping saliva as it reared up on its powerful hind legs. Call for help! I shouted at the terrified man beside me. His hands trembled but he managed to grab his phone and dial what seemed like the emergency number. However, the reception was barely audible. Realizing that there would be no help arriving in time, we focused on doing whatever we needed to do to get away from this horrifying beast. Desperate to create some distance between us and our monstrous assailant, I scanned the area for a potential plan. There! Up the tree! I shouted, pointing in the direction of a large oak tree standing tall nearby. We sprinted toward the tree with adrenaline surging through our veins. Gripping onto the first branch we could reach, we hoisted ourselves up one limb after another until we were about twenty feet from the forest floor. As I glanced downward, my heart dropped into my stomach as I watched the creature follow suit with its grotesque limbs gripping onto each branch effortlessly. In a panic, I looked around for potential weapons or methods of escape and spotted a large dead branch about five feet away. As carefully and quickly as possible, I grabbed hold of it and snapped it off from its connection to the tree trunk. Catching my breath, I glanced down again at our revolting pursuer. It surveyed us hungrily but with hesitation, 
seemingly trying to gauge whether it was worth continuing its relentless climb or not. Taking advantage of this brief pause, I began swinging the large branch at it with all my strength as it resumed climbing towards us. The creature snarled at me in frustration, narrowly dodging each swing of my makeshift weapon. Fearing that our lives were on a razor's edge and with my energy waning quickly, I mustered one final blow using every ounce of strength left within me. Striking it square in the face with a powerful, resounding crack, the creature froze for a moment before losing its grip on the tree. As it plummeted to the ground, its disgusting body crumpled under the force of gravity and crashed heavily against the forest floor. It let out a sickening groan before lying still. Exhausted and relieved, we started making our way back down. Once safely on solid ground, we cautiously approached the motionless monstrosity. Unwilling to assume that we were truly safe, we ensured that it was indeed dead and unable to cause further harm. The sight that lay before us proved that whatever this creature had once been, it was now truly just an aberration, a twisted mix of man and animal. After taking a moment to collect ourselves, we noticed searchlights in the distance accompanied by distant calls of our names. It seemed help had finally arrived in response to our desperate call from earlier. As authorities arrived, they surveyed the grisly scene in disbelief. They urged us to leave further investigation and clean up to them, trying to shield us as much as possible from any additional trauma. In the following days and weeks, although life continued as normal for most people unaware of what had transpired in the woods that night, either of us could shake off what we had encountered. I resumed hunting but often found myself tensely scanning my surroundings in fear of being confronted by another nightmarish creature like the one that still haunted my thoughts. I frequently visited the man I had helped save on that horrifying evening. While grateful for my assistance during our ordeal, he couldn't help but mourn for his friend who had been taken from him by such a repulsive being. Life would never be quite the same after our chilling encounter. However, amid all of these nerve-wracking memories, one small piece of solace remained, knowing that thanks to our quick thinking and determination, at least one of these twisted monsters had been stopped. Still, the lingering question from that treacherous night nagged at us both, how many more of these creatures might exist, prowling in the shadows of the forest? This happened to me two summers ago. I had just finished a long day of hiking in the Appalachian Mountains and was looking for a quiet little spot to relax and enjoy the serene beauty of nature. I'm Evan Foster, an experienced hiker from Chicago who decided to try something new that summer. I stopped at a store not far from Spruce Knob, West Virginia where the locals exchanged stories of unexplained disappearances and ominous figures lurking in the woods. Of course, I took it all with a grain of salt, blaming the stories on exaggeration spurred by boredom. Around nightfall, I made a strategic decision to head off the beaten path. There was an area I had seen on some older maps that seemed secluded and inviting. As I set up my campsite, I saw a group of people approaching from the distance. They were rugged-looking men covered in grime and dirt. Their appearance did not match their friendly demeanor, as they introduced themselves with warm smiles. Names such as Cletus Huxley or Otis Corbin were exchanged in low tones. While we sat around the campfire talking about life and laughing off our worries— one of them made an innocent slip about a cave nearby where they had holed up for winter months before relocating elsewhere. Intrigued, I asked to see it the next morning. They hesitated but eventually agreed. Following the worn path to their cave adobe, tension grew among us as each step tore at the silence betwixt man and nature. 
The cave entrance was narrow but appeared large enough to accommodate six grown men comfortably. However, what those dark depths contained seemed far from welcoming. All right there, Evan, one gruff voice called out as they bolted back toward their own dwelling place. We're off now. You wanted to see it. We obliged. Thanks for last night's good times and catch you around. Their departure meant I was alone in this unsettling place. Curiosity gnawing at the edge of my mind, the cave called to me again. Without hesitation, I ventured alone into the darkness. Once I had groped my way inside, I felt something squishy beneath my boot, a newspaper article from the past, turning to mulch due to time and neglect. Picking up a readable piece, one word jumped out at me. Missing. Heart pounding, I pushed forward. The cave swelled into a massive chamber, dimly illuminated by sunlight reflecting off water from the entrance. Near the back wall were signs that the men had lived there, trinkets, furniture, bedding. But corpses far less decomposed than their surroundings littered every corner. As if knowing I was about to panic, something rustled behind me. I turned quickly into darkness but found no one or anything in sight. My legs gave way as the realization occurred. Those friendly mountain men were actually cannibalistic hunters preying on those who entered their territory. Desperately trying to escape that horrific scene and scathed and unnoticed, I left behind a substantial trail which only grew more conspicuous as fear guided my steps farther from the cave. A terrible scream ripped through the silence, a cry out for help never answered. I stumbled through the underbrush, breathing heavily. My whole body trembled from fear. Every snapped twig, rustling leaf, or faint sound sent my heart racing. I couldn't stay here. I had to find a way out, and quickly too. After trudging for an hour or so, I spotted a hiker on a nearby trail. Relief washed over me as I called out to them. Hey! Please help me! I need to get away from here. I shouted, my voice cracking from panic. The hiker hurried towards me with evident concern. What's wrong? What happened? They inquired, eyes wide with anxiety. I found this cave back there. The men I met before, they're cannibals. They're hunting people. I spoke frantically between breaths. My words seemed almost unbelievable to the hiker but they saw the terror etched on my face and realized the gravity of the situation. We need to go now, they said urgently. There's a ranger station not far from here. We can call for help there. We hurried together towards the station, our minds fraught with dread as we prayed the cannibals wouldn't catch up to us. Upon arriving at the ranger station, we rushed inside and found a radio to call for assistance. Mayday! Mayday! This is an emergency! The hiker's voice crackled through the radio as they recounted our dire situation. After a tense moment of silence, a response finally came through. Calm down! Help is on its way! Just stay put and keep your eyes open! Within minutes... Armed rangers arrived and began their search for the cave based on my partial description of its location. The two of us remained safely in the vicinity as we awaited news regarding their confrontation with the cannibalistic hunters. Hours painstakingly passed before any updates arrived. By then, darkness had enveloped the entire area, making visibility a challenge. Finally, one of the rangers reappeared and walked towards us, an odd mix of relief and unease on his face. We found the cave, and its grisly contents. We've never encountered anything quite like this in these mountains. There were indeed three men at the cave, and we managed to apprehend them without incident. We're still unraveling their motives. Their confirmation brought a temporary sense of security knowing that the murderers were now in custody, 
but there were still so many questions unanswered. The story made headlines locally and beyond as people reacted in horror and disbelief at what had transpired. A few days later, I contacted the family of one of the victims whose remains I saw in the cave, extending my condolences for their unimaginable loss. The father quietly thanked me for reaching out. It was a reminder that there were innocent people who suffered directly from these dreadful events. As time went on, news broke that an underground cannibalistic cult operated within the secluded mountain range. The three men I encountered were apparently part of this twisted group. It was chilling to discover how close I had come to becoming another victim. Months passed and life slowly resumed a semblance of normalcy. Yet I never forgot those gruesome days spent in those haunted mountains. There would always be raw memories lingering from that fateful encounter, echoes of frightened voices and twisted faces that no amount of time could erase. And as I moved forward, I knew those darkest secrets hidden within the mountains would remain permanently etched in my mind as a stark warning. Some things are better left undiscovered. This happened to me twelve years ago in the dense redwood forest in Northern California. My name is Jebediah Burroughs, and I'm a forest worker. Tall trees and the distant calls of birds surrounded me while I continued my normal tasks. My co-worker, Lucinda Kenyon, was working a few yards away from me. She complained about having to check another path for dead trees. We agreed on switching tasks later on as we shared a laugh about Lewis, our clumsy co-worker. About an hour into my workday, I came across an utterly disheveled camping site that looked like somebody had turned the place inside out. Tents ripped apart, trash scattered everywhere, and eerily enough, no signs of the campers. I radioed Lucinda to let her know about this mess, but received only static in response. Growing concerned, I decided it was necessary for us to regroup. Making my way back to meet Lucinda, I found her standing by a tree with a horrified expression on her face. Her eyes were fixated upon a grotesque sight, a middle-aged man with deep gashes all over his body, lying lifeless on the ground. Dread washed over me as we tried and failed to call authorities due to poor signal reception. Hesitantly continuing our search for other campers, we discovered an older woman sobbing uncontrollably near a turned-over canoe. She was bruised and battered presumably another victim of whatever violent act had occurred. The frantic woman told us what happened in between sobs. Her group had been attacked by a monstrous creature with razor-sharp claws and an insatiable hunger for bloodshed in the night, a creature with piercing blue eyes that hunted them down one by one before disappearing into the cover of the woods. Realizing that we were all in danger by staying here any longer, Lucinda and I instructed the woman to stay where she was while we did our best to find any other survivors or at least a way out. As we ventured deeper into the dense woods, we saw numerous birds flying frantically away from a particular area in odd occurrence that left a pit in my stomach. We hesitated for a moment but concluded that the birds' distress call-like behavior was enough reason to check the suspicious area, hoping not to come face to face with the creature the woman described. Creeping slowly and cautiously towards the disturbance, we stumbled upon broken branches and a trail of blood leading us to believe that whatever had occurred here recently was nothing short of gruesome. Suddenly, Lucinda let out a sharp gasp as we noticed smashed cameras and mutilated camping equipment scattered across the forest floor. I could feel my nerves reaching their peak when the piercing blue eyes emerged from deep within the surrounding shadows. The creature lunged forward snarling and showing off its razor-sharp claws. In absolute terror, Lucinda launched herself toward me in an attempt to escape, 
just narrowly dodging the creature's first attack. Panicking as I tried to come up with some sort of plan, I remembered a flare gun in my backpack. Quickly scrambling to load it in desperation, I aimed it straight at the beast's heinous face. Realizing that fighting this monstrous being would be futile without proper help, we resolved that now would be far better to find an escape route and return with reinforcements when it was safer. With the flare gun in hand, I pulled the trigger, sending a burst of bright red light towards the creature's face. It recoiled, shielding its eyes from the blinding light before letting out a guttural cry. Seizing the opportunity, Lucinda and I bolted in the opposite direction, adrenaline pumping through our veins as we fled. Our hearts pounded as we ran through the woods, trying to put as much distance between us and this terrifying monster as possible. The persistent snapping of branches from behind was a constant reminder that it was hot on our trail. Call for help! Lucinda shouted as reality started to sink in. Can your phone get any signal? I quickly grabbed my phone and saw there was no reception. No, nothing. We'll have to keep moving and try to find help or signal. I responded desperately. The creature's roars grew distant as we stumbled upon an old hunting cabin. There was no need to call for help if we could barricade ourselves, buying time to plan our escape, or even wait for someone else to discover our disappearance. As swiftly and quietly as we could manage, we entered the cabin and fortified all entrances. We hid in silence, the only sound our heavy breathing trying not to give away our position. Several hours passed with no sign of the creature. With night fast approaching and daylight fading, we decided to evaluate our options. We can't stay here forever, I whispered. We have to find a way back to civilization. Lucinda nodded in agreement but stated her concerns. We have no weapons and no idea how far we've gone or what else is out there waiting for us. As if on cue, a gut-wrenching howl echoed through the woods indicating that the creature had found our hiding spot. Panic-stricken murmurs filled the room between us before being overwhelmed by an aggressive pounding at our barricaded door. We looked around frantically in search of anything that we could use to defend ourselves with, only to come up short. Moments later, the door was violently torn from its hinges. The creature stood before us, its fur matted with blood, visible scars from earlier conflicts, and hunger in its unnerving blue eyes. Our bodies were paralyzed by fear as it stalked toward us with malicious intent shining behind those chilling eyes. As it raised one massive claw, preparing to strike, a gunshot resonated throughout the cabin, followed by a deafening thud. An older man wearing a tattered hunting jacket and carrying a shotgun stood in the entrance of what remained of our hideout. He cautiously approached the fallen creature as we stared in utter disbelief and gratitude. I won't lie to ya. I've been tracking this thing for days, he offered as an explanation before turning to the beast. Never seen anything like this in my life. As he guided us through the woods back towards town, he explained his discovery of mutilated animal corpses littering the forest, searching for answers where there seemed to be none. Upon reaching safety, Lucinda and I exchanged our thanks with our newfound ally before contacting the local authorities about our encounter with the creature. The experience left us with questions and nightmares we knew would stay with us for a long time. Despite not knowing much about folklore or th origins of this monstrous being, Lucinda and I couldn't shake how it mirrored something out of legends. Whether it was some mutated offspring of nature's darkest corners or an escaped experiment from an undisclosed location, it didn't matter. The monster we encountered would never cease to haunt us. And though there was still no solid answer on its species or existence, one thing remained certain, 
Somewhere within the shadows of those dark woods existed creatures beyond our comprehension and realms unreachable by human understanding. The only solace was that we lived to tell the tale and warn others of the horrors that lurked in the dense forest. As days turned to weeks and life slowly returned to normal, Lucinda and I made a vow never to set foot in those woods again, burdened with the harrowing memories of that night. To this day, the cries and eerie blue eyes of that creature mark an undying fear that will forever linger within us. This happened to me a few years ago. Now, here's the thing about me. I never liked RVs. There's just something about them that always rubbed me the wrong way. They feel cramped, plastic, and let's be honest, most of them come with some truly terrible interior design choices. But my fiancé, Alara, was desperate to visit some of the smaller national parks out west. It's what she called our Grand Tour, where we would try to pack in as many parks as possible over a three-week stretch. My name's Ishan, by the way. That first week went surprisingly well. We picked up the RV in Phoenix and worked our way up through Zion and Bryce Canyon in Utah. It was the remote stuff that excited Alara the kind of winding roads that take you deeper into the landscape until even the cell signal gives up the ghost. We found ourselves a pull-off in a corner of Capitol Reef National Park, surrounded by these massive sandstone cliffs glowing in the late afternoon sun. I'm not going to lie it was spectacular. We cooked under the awning, and I even admitted that yeah, maybe those awful paisley interior cushions had their own kind of charm in this light. The moment was broken by a tapping at the driver's side window. Standing there was an old man, looking weathered and disheveled like he'd spent weeks camping without a bath. He gave us a hesitant smile, said his truck ran out of gas a few miles back, and could we be a good Samaritan to give him a ride to the ranger station? No phone service up here, of course, and his old knees weren't up for the hike. My first instinct was a, no, there was something, unsettling about this guy. But Alara jumped up, insisted this was exactly what this epic, van life, road trip was all about, helping folks, you know? Besides, he needed our help. And he climbed, the van filling with a musty odor that wasn't there before. The guy hardly spoke while we turned back for the main road. I noticed he kept touching his faded camouflage backpack, like whatever was inside held something precious. I glanced at Alara, caught her worried expression reflected back at me. He directed us back, further on a dusty dirt road I swore wasn't even marked on our map. Said there was a shortcut, knew these hills like the back of his hand. After what felt like hours, we arrived not at a ranger station, but an abandoned campsite with crumbling brick fire pits and what looked like an overgrown shack hidden on the far slope. My gut told me to put the RV in reverse, leave this dude in the dust, but Alara was already halfway out the door offering him water. Something just snapped in me then. Okay, that's enough, I yelled, probably louder than needed. Thanks for the ride, this guy muttered, slipping down from the cab with his bag tucked tight underneath his arm. That's when I saw the knife tucked into his belt. Let's see what's so important, I told him, stepping closer. There was a struggle, brief but enough to feel his strange strength fueled by desperation. Elara screamed, I stumbled back, and well, then it got really bad. It's still hazy, all those moments between my fall and seeing them both run up a narrow track into the hills and out of sight. By some miracle, I was able to find the main road after what must have been hours of walking. Park rangers had arrived, searched all day for Alara. The place felt cursed, 
that hidden camp swallowed by the shadows of the surrounding cliffs. In the back of my mind, I couldn't shake the image of them both vanishing into the distance, swallowed by the vastness of a wild space I never should have entered. Alara still listed as missing. There were rumors about other lost hikers. The cops muttered something about hermits up in those hills but they found nothing solid during their search. Every so often, late at night, I think I see the glow of an RV headlight from my apartment window. A cruel trick of the street lamps. Some nights, I find myself mapping out the parks from our trip, remembering every twist and turn. Logically, I know what happened was something human, explainable. A man desperate enough to use the ruse of a broken-down truck, a remote spot, and an overly trusting traveler. That's how it must have gone. Yet, every time I close my eyes, all I see is a Lara vanishing into the wilderness. All I feel is the memory of that musty smell of dried pine needles and something deeper, older, unyielding. There's nothing so universal as the feeling of uncanny silence that befalls a room where loud, clamorous machinery used to operate non-stop. That precise depth of quiet coated the air as I stepped into the secure lab nestled within the dense forests of the Pacific Northwest. The remoteness of our government facility never ceased to evoke a sense of isolation, but no day had it been as palpable as now. My colleague, Tiberius Wexler, an eccentric man with wild notions punctuated by a bushy mustache, was missing. He had dedicated his life to genetic research with an enthusiasm that was both inspiring and concerning. Standing in the sterile chill of Lab Room B, I called his name, expecting him to emerge from some hidden alcove where he might have fallen asleep after poring over gene sequences. There was no answer. Instead, a gruesome scene unfolded before me. Tiberius's workstation was splattered wildly with red. Dashes of blood cast across monitors and papers like macabre strokes from a deranged artist's brush. Why hadn't he called for help? His phone lay shattered in a corner, its pieces telling a silent tale of desperation. And then there were footprints— Large, clawed impressions trailing away from the chaos and disappearing into the depths of halcyon woods that surrounded our facility. I gripped the pistol I always carried, a standard precaution issued by higher-ups, but it offered little comfort against an unknown monstrosity I had believed only existed in folklore. Refusing to let panic take hold, I strategized quickly with Mira Lark's son, our resident security officer who had appeared beside me, her hand steady on her own firearm. Her stern features belied an undercurrent of tension as she voiced what we all dreaded. We head into those woods. The forest swallowed us whole with its thicket underbrush and towering pines that shrouded everything beneath ancient boughs. We pushed deeper through the wild terrain, marks on trees hinting at our quarry's path a malingering shadow that haunted our every step. Suddenly Mira stopped dead in her tracks. Something grisly dangled above us among the rustling leaves. A partially devoured deer suspended grotesquely as if left on display. It's playing with us. Rosella Pike chimed in behind us. Her expertise in tracking was unparalleled, though her sharp wit did little to ease my nerves this time. Slogging forward became laborious as we unwittingly stepped into swampier ground, the perfect hiding place for anything wanting not to be found. All at once, Rosella let out a loud scoff which cut through the silence like a blade. Fancy going to work thinking you'll change the world and ending up on a wildlife goose chase instead. Her joke should have elicited laughter. However, Jangled nerves turned it sour on our tongues as we continued onward, weapons drawn and eyes darting between shafts of dim light piercing the canopy. 
moments transformed into acute awareness when an ear-piercing roar snatched tranquility away from us like thieves in the night. Senses heightened to razor-edge tautness when swaying branches heralded its approach. The amalgamation of myth and genetic aberration born from mankind's tampering danced just beyond sight within shaded green. Avoiding crass exclamations or unprofessional reactions was difficult with adrenaline coursing hotly through my veins. All training focused solely on survival and protection protocols against something out there that defied explanation or reason. With Rosella leading and Mira covering our flank, we moved stealthily through dense brush until reaching what seemed like an ambush site, cleverly concealed within nature's embrace. Abrupt movements ahead drew our aim before stiffness seized my muscles. Notice too late, the sagacious predator leaping towards us from behind. The roar ceased as quickly as it came, replaced by a silence more menacing than the cacophony before. I froze midstep. Every muscle in my body coiled tight. Rosella and Mira stopped too, their trained eyes scanning for threats. We didn't have to wait long for our assailant to reveal itself. There was a rustle to the left, a shadow moved, a shape too large and distorted to be human. It was upon us in seconds. Mira screamed as it barreled into her, knocking her to the ground with astonishing force. The predator was massive, leagues beyond any normal wildlife, its dark fur matted with what looked like, was that blood? I could not help her. Everything about this monster spelled death. The urge to survive overtook everything else. Escape was the only option. Rosella seemed to think the same as she whispered, Run, with urgency. The forest became a blur, as we sprinted away from the attack site. Behind us, wet snarls mixed with Myra's shouts until they faded into nothingness. Rosella led us to a small clearing where we stopped, gasping for breath but aware that stopping might mean death. We needed help but there was no signal on our phones. This part of the forest was too remote. We pressed on instead of succumbing to helplessness. Hours passed or maybe minutes. It was impossible to tell in our state of dread and exertion. The sound of breaking twigs nearby alerted us again. It had tracked us. How, we couldn't guess. Its form emerged from the trees directly ahead, thrusting its bulk with such force it snapped branches without effort. Thick muscles rippled beneath its sable coat as it propelled itself towards Rosella. She didn't stand a chance. Its jaws clamped around her torso and dragged her back into the thicket with brutal efficiency. Alone and weaponless, I dropped mine in the first encounter. I ran with renewed desperation. It could have been mercy or neglect that allowed my escape. I found a road just as daylight waned and flagged down a passing vehicle that took me straight to the authorities. I recounted what happened no fewer than ten times that night, but my explanation held gaps big enough for skeptics to crawl through. Explanations came later in hushed tones from locals familiar with whispers of an unnatural presence lurking since recent illegal genetic experiments had gone awry, their own version of Frankenstein's creature terrorizing their woods. It's been three days since the ambush, and there's been no sign of Rosella or Mira. Search parties return empty-handed each time. Only upturned soil and broken branches marked where we had been. The police keep details close, but word has spread of something unexplainable haunting those woods. In remembrance of Rosella and Mira, I dread understanding what hunted us, an embodiment of human error, a creature never intended for this world released by careless ambition an apex predator shaped by man yet unrestrained by science or conscience. Their memory serves as a grave marker for our arrogance, and their ultimate sacrifice a plea for respect toward forces we don't fully understand or control. Now I sit here writing this account, a warning etched in loss, not knowing if I escaped death or if it let me live only to tell its story, 
a story far removed from any desire to change the world, but one that must be told nonetheless. They say necessity is the mother of invention, but for me, it was sheer curiosity that led me to work at this isolated government facility deep within the forests of the Pacific Northwest. Unfamiliar surnames were the norm around here. I worked alongside Joran Keppen and Coraline Tresser, a pair of brilliant scientists engrossed in their tasks. The facility carried a vibe of clinical sterilization, where behind each secured door, secrets thrived and rules from the outside world no longer applied. It wasn't unusual for our work to run deep into the night, but on that particular evening, we were hurrying to wrap up a delicate phase of our genetic experimentation. The fluorescent lights flickered as an unexpected power dip caused a collective groan among us. Great, did someone forget to feed the hamsters in the generator again? Joran joked, inciting chuckles around the room. We weren't truly concerned. It happened now and then when the energy demand spiked. The backup generators kicked in and everything resumed to its previous state until Joran noticed something off with our secure containment unit. A light that should have been blinking steadily was ominously dark. That's not supposed to happen, he muttered eyes narrowing with professional concern. Moments later, we heard an arduous crashing sound from the corridor, an echo that seemed to bounce off every sterile surface and fill the air with foreboding disquiet. Coraline glanced towards me. Her expression told me she'd rather be face to face with her worst statistical anomaly than whatever might be causing such a ruckus. A quick check confirmed our fear. One of our experimental subjects was unaccounted for, a creation born of splicing genes sinfully never meant to coexist. While named in various folklore across cultures, no words came to mind now as we armed ourselves with tranquilizer guns. The policy for situations very wrongly dubbed containment breaches. Joran led, gun held ready as we stepped cautiously through the swaying pines outside where nature had turned her back on silence. The usually comforting rustle of leaves sounded like whispers of warning tonight. Suddenly Coraline's radio hissed alive. Unidentified movement near sector. The message cut out as sharp static assaulted our ears. The forest around us was deceptively peaceful until a disturbance broke our focus. A symphony of leaves rustling aggressively against something large moving through them. No known animal moved like that. It defied all my years of training and field experience. This wasn't just animal behavior. It was purposeful, intelligent. Our hearts skipped beats as fleeting shadows danced just beyond the reach of our flashlights. Figures twisted in forms both familiar yet grotesquely foreign. Not daring to speak and give away our position more than we already had, Coraline subtly indicated toward what appeared to be a shadow slightly denser than its peers. We edged forward, boots treading silently on the damp bed of pine needles beneath us a natural carpet muffling our steps but also those of whatever stalked us from just beyond sight. Each drawn breath tasted cool and moist as adrenaline swam through my veins, a feeling I knew all too well from field training, though I never expected it to arise here. Every snap twig or crushed leaf sounded thunderous in my ears as we spotted something a half-glimpsed silhouette darting behind a tree thick enough to hide its entire girth. An ear-splitting screech echoed through the woods as Joran turned abruptly, his arm flung out almost involuntarily before he steeled himself and whispered harshly that we needed a better visual before firing willy-nilly. Joran's whisper snapped me back to reality. Coraline and I exchanged glances before sinking further into cover. We were field biologists, not soldiers. Our expertise was wildlife, not survival against an unknown assailant. 
The forest around us had become a maze of dark threats lurking behind each tree, but we remained silent. Fleeing would have meant noise a betrayal of our position so we lay in wait, hoping the creature would reveal itself. Minutes stretched. The only signs of life were the chaotic movements of the shadows and the sporadic rustling of leaves. Then it happened. The creature pounced at something to our left with speed that rendered it almost invisible. Only its effects were visible. A shriek filled the night as something small, presumably prey, met its end at the hands, or claws, of our stalker. Despite our reservations, now seemed the only chance to escape while the creature was busy. We made a break for it, a distance we estimated would bring us closer to civilization or at least out of what felt like this monster's territory. As we ran, a chilling sound stopped us in our tracks, a scream that was unmistakably human pierced through the night air. Instinctively we turned toward it. It was Joran lagging behind us and swiping at empty air as if caught in an invisible tangle. But then a real assailant presented itself, obscured partially by shadow. It stood taller than any man I'd ever seen and impossibly lean with elongated limbs that seemed capable of enveloping prey from a distance. I wanted to call for help but realized how futile it would be. The forest muffled sound and we'd hiked hours from any known trail. Any signal or attempt would likely attract more attention than rescue. Coraline stared frozen as I grabbed her arm, attempting to pull her away from what we witnessed, a grisly scene where blood was visible even in this limited light as Joran was pulled into darkness by unfeeling hands. We stumbled through brush and undergrowth towards what we hoped was safety. The only goal that occupied my thoughts was reaching populated areas again. As dawn approached and light began to edge out darkness, we encountered park rangers who were alerted by concerned friends due to our missed check-in. They gathered details through our exhausted whispers just moments before they found what was left of Joran, mangled beyond recognition except for clothing fragments. The notion circulated among authorities posited an attack by some endangered predator, an animal driven desperate by deforestation maybe. Racked with grief yet fueled by determination, words spread about dangers in those woods long avoided by locals but never fully understood by outsiders like us until now. The memory lingered long after, fleeting shadows signaling danger in untouched wilds where knowledge meets stark reality one where sometimes what lurks beyond sight demands respect through fear. Every morning, I wake up with the same monotony of knowing the open road is my only true companion. It's not a life many envy, but it suits me just fine. My name is Elliot Hawk and I'm a truck driver by trade. The rhythm of the rolling tires against asphalt is a lulling tune that's become my life's soundtrack. Today was just another haul, taking a load from one dot on the map to another. This job had me cutting through Nebraska, flatlands as far as the eye could see, swallowed eventually by the thickets of old oak forests. I recall thinking it odd when I first noticed the abandoned cars on the roadside just outside of Broken Bow, a place that feels as if it's on the brink of becoming a ghost town. No locals milling about, no children playing. It seemed life itself had taken a detour around this slice of the American quilt. Hours rolled by uneventfully until my radio crackled to life a broken and almost frantic call for help haphazardly cutting through static. I could barely make out a plea. It was urgent, thick with fear, but it disappeared before it gave any sense of direction or purpose. I reached for my own radio to report it but grasped nothing but silence. There was no signal, no way to call out. The sun hung low as I veered into a narrow dirt path leading toward an old milling factory for my final stop. It stood there, 
this decrepit behemoth of rust and discarded promises, seemingly untouched by time but not decay. As I backed up the rig to the loading docks, an unease swelled within me, an awareness that something was amiss. A door creaked open, metal grinding on metal, and from within that yawning maw emerged a figure, tall and gaunt with hawk-like eyes that seemed to pierce right through flesh and steel alike. His leathery skin stretched tightly over his skull, and his thin lips were set in a grim line. He had no name to me. He was just an unsettling presence, an antagonist to my tranquility. We exchanged no words. No pleasantries were uttered whilst unloading my cargo. He only watched each box unloaded with an intensity that made my skin crawl. Then it started, a game of cat and mouse in broad daylight within this isolated factory setting. He would appear and vanish amongst machinery like a phantom, a ghost whose haunting was limited not by walls but by his own twisted amusement. Each encounter grew more menacing than the last. The close calls where his hands nearly grasped my shirt, or when he stepped out just inches away from behind an ancient millstone. I tried to make light of each situation at first, humor being my shield against uprising terror, a joke about health and safety inspections gone awry under my breath or no laugh in this deserted theater of suspense. But as nightfall encroached upon us, so too did he draw nearer with intention shrouded in malice, the dim glow from the warehouse windows casting long shadows like dark specters bearing witness to what may come. My heart pounded not just from exertion but dread. Each moment stretched infinitely as I ducked between conveyors and climbed up rusting ladders trying to keep one step ahead. A sudden collision— a box crashing down sent echoes through hollow halls. I knew then that darkness wasn't merely descending from night's embrace. I felt hunted within its grasp. Sweat trickled along temples, not from physical labor but raw fear, as I supplicated for some divine reprieve or perhaps just simple luck upon realizing there were miles between us and civilization, no soul around to hear or see this grim game unfold. There's irony in knowing people sometimes look for monsters in tales when men like him walk and breathe terror into reality without fangs or claws, just cruel intentions carried out with bare hands wrought firm. Panic settled as I heard the heavy footsteps approaching. I slid under a metal workbench, my breaths quiet and shallow. Glancing out, I saw boots stop near my hiding spot. The man wore steel-toed boots, stained jeans, and a black hoodie. He was over six feet, broad shoulders outlined by the dim light coming through dirty windows. I recalled the name tag from his uniform earlier, Dan. Reasoning behind his pursuit was unknown. Fear kept me from wondering too much about motives. He moved past without noticing. I waited for a sign that he had gone far enough away. My phone was in my pocket, but fear of a sound gave me pause. That hesitation could mean life or death. Minutes felt heavy and hats until footsteps faded. I slid out from hiding and moved towards an exit sign in the back of the warehouse. Reaching the door, it creaked loudly as it opened. Outside was just a vast isolation of industrial complex surrounded by woods. My mind raced to remember the layout of the grounds. Trucks parked at loading docks on the other side could provide cover to escape. But as I edged around the side of the building, Dan emerged from another door holding something metallic in his hand. I didn't wait to find out what it was. I ran. Between cargo containers and trucks— I wove a path to put distance between us. The chase continued until I reached an old office trailer. I pounded on the door, shouting for help, when suddenly arms grabbed me from behind. A struggle ensued, but without combat training, my efforts were futile against Dan's superior strength. A cry caught Dan's attention just long enough for me to break free. 
It came from Tom, night security who'd heard my shouts. Bloodied but determined, Tom tackled Dan to the ground. I used this chance and called 911 with trembling fingers while Tom fought to keep Dan restrained. Police arrived soon after. They arrested Dan who had several knives on him. The glint of them still burned into my memory. Tom needed medical attention. He'd been cut protecting me. He survived but would carry scars forever. In those days that followed we learned that Dan had been fired recently for violent behavior and assumed revenge on previous colleagues was his aim. I returned to work eventually but couldn't shake off the feeling of vulnerability that chained itself around me after that night. The experience lingered like fog clinging to morning hills, a grim reminder of how quickly safety can shatter into peril when paths cross with someone bent on harm. I often passed Tom during my shifts. Words weren't necessary for our shared nod of understanding about surviving that fateful encounter under darkening skies within walls that bore witness to terror at human hands without monstrous disguise. Everyone thinks they know their hometown like the back of their hand until something skews the familiar into something horrific. I was on patrol in the Hocking Hills State Park in Ohio, a labyrinth of startling rock formations and verdant foliage where locals and tourists alike sought refuge from the grind of daily life. My name is Tate Harlow, and for a decade, my green uniform had been synonymous with safety in these woods. My days cycled through missing persons, illegal campfires, and occasionally gut-wrenching discoveries that brought tears to the eyes of seasoned officers. This particular day shifted from routine to unforgettable in mere moments. It started when I found a wallet near Old Man's Cave, no ID inside, just a smattering of receipts and a cryptic scribble on a napkin. The sky grew heavy, Clouds dense like steel wool as sounds turned muffled against the impending storm. Everything was normal, until a piercing scream cut through the park's usual symphony. Without conscious thought, my legs carried me towards the sound. Mid-step, I collided with something unseen, an invisible barrier that sent me sprawling. Wiping dirt from my hands and ignoring the sting on my palms— I peered ahead to find nothing but trees in every direction. The silence was oppressive. My radio crackled alive with static as I tried calling for backup but received no response. Just then, Henrietta Bloom, one of my colleagues farthest out, informed me we lost track of a group of hikers last seen near where I stood. We heard disturbing tales woven by locals— stories strangers might dismiss as tall tales, about the Hollow's Guardian, described as an immense creature with milky eyes and impossibly long fingers that could steal you away unnoticed. Ridiculous superstitions I'd mused over tankards with fellow rangers, never taking them seriously. As night unrolled its dark canvas upon us, Unease took root within my chest while my flashlight struggled against an encroaching obscurity that seemed to swallow light whole. Parting thickets revealed glimpses of shadows stretching beyond ordinary silhouettes. An aggressive rustling not far off made me clench my service weapon tightly for the first time in years without derision for such a precaution. Ahead lay another discarded item— this time a tattered backpack with its contents spilled like innards across the forest floor. Phone lines were down. We were on our own out here. Cursing under my breath but refusing to show fear before shadows or superstitious tales, I pressed on deeper into twilight's embrace. Suddenly there it was tall and gaunt against an impossibly dense backdrop so real it scraped away any trace of doubt from my mind. Instinct shrieked within me as it moved eerily silent towards where I stood frozen, warping reality around it as tendrils of misty breath escaped what could barely be termed lips. My breath halted. 
the creature stepped forward. Its skin, pale and stretched over elongated bones, reflected the dim light from my flashlight. Saliva dripped from its gaping maw, and sharp teeth gleamed in a hideous grin. It was nothing like any bear or cougar I'd encountered in these woods. I backed away step by step without breaking eye contact, comprehending that my weapon would be useless against this being of significant size and apparent strength. I needed to escape, find help. But with phone lines down, it would come down to running back to the station miles away. The beast seemed to understand my intent and lunged. Turning on my heel, I sprinted. Branches whipped my face as I hurtled through darkness towards where I hoped safety lay. Breathless shouts escaped me as I broke into the clearing where our vehicles stood. The creature crashed through the underbrush behind me. It caught up with swiftness that defied its massive frame. Its fingers grazed my shoulder, sharp, cold, a promise of death. By some miracle, I stumbled into the ranger station, shouting for backup, my voice hoarse with terror and exertion. Ed, the night shift operator on duty, grabbed a rifle, his eyes wide at sight of blood trickling down my arm. It's out there! Something. No need for further words. Ed understood the gravity of the situation as distant roars validated my panic-stricken arrival. We barricaded inside the station. Hours ticked by as search parties were mobilized from nearby areas via radio since our lines remained dead. Dawn's early light brought reinforcement none too soon. What they found in the woods will haunt me forever. Remains of our missing hikers scattered in gruesome disarray around a cave that housed no ordinary predator. The ground swathed in pieces of flesh and bone, evidence of a creature existing outside known species, one we tracked but never found again. In memory of those lost, became an epitaph we spoke in solitude but never mentioned again among survivors or reports that circled back to us from officials naming bear attacks or cougars gone rogue, easier for minds to accept than what we witnessed. I wake each day knowing what lurks unseen, choosing life over truth's pursuit while hoping we remain in ignorant peace. My alarm goes off just as the sun creeps over the horizon, its light barely touching the tops of the trees that surround my small cabin in Hayden Valley, Yellowstone. I am Heath Wilder, a name as rugged as the landscape I've sworn to protect in my years as a park ranger. Today felt ordinary. I had no reason to expect it wouldn't be filled with the routine checks and occasional tourist assistance. Morning light spilt over my dashboard, illuminating the routine reports as I drove along the dirt road that twisted like a snake through the valley. A missing persons report was first on my list. A hiker named Tamson Greer who hadn't returned from her evening walk cases like these weren't new to me. Nature often led people astray. As I ventured deeper into the dense woods to begin my search— I came across a scene that disturbed the very essence of natural order, a circle of wildlife, motionless. Deer, foxes, even birds all lay in a perfect ring, not a mark on them but devoid of life. No predator known to this region did this, no human either. I radioed HQ to report this anomaly but received nothing but static in response, a common nuisance in this sprawling wilderness. As the eeriness settled in and I left behind the foreboding circle, footprints caught my eye. Sizable depressions formed an erratic path leading away from the circle towards an old network of caves at Skyrim, crevices and dark hollows that played host to legends and whispers among locals. Delving further into these caverns wasn't something done without cause. They were treacherous and unwelcoming. Nonetheless, Tamson's life may have depended on it. Sounds seemed to die within those walls. 
The damp, earthy scent carried an undercurrent of something foul as I headed deeper into the caves. My flashlight beam cut through the darkness revealing jagged rocks and remnants of clothing. Tamson's or someone else's? Impossible to tell. The echoing drip of water was abruptly joined by another sound, that of heavy, labored breathing indifferent to human presence and unnerving scrapes against stones suggesting a form too vast for any known creature. Adrenaline shot through my veins as shadows took on menacing shapes just beyond my light's reach. It dawned on me that whatever shared this space might not be bound by natural laws I understood. Footsteps approached me from behind just as something colossal ahead blocked out what little light fought its way down from a distant opening above. Whirling around with my firearm drawn and met with darkness so thick that it felt tangible but no sign of life or movement. Silence returned save for my own shallow breaths resonating off cave walls. I turned, fighting panic, knowing escape was the only option. My move had to be fast. I retreated towards the entrance, each step deliberate to avoid falls or injury. Calling for help was not an option. My phone had no signal within the labyrinth of rock. Ahead, the creature loomed. Its body was massive, with mottled skin that seemed to shift in hue between the rocks and shadows. Long limbs ended in claws, adept for navigating the rough terrain of its home, the caves. Its eyes glinted briefly as my light crossed them, a predator's gaze. I could not place its kind, an animal undiscovered or a remnant of an era long past. It hissed, a sound filled with hunger and intent. It began to advance, slow but certain in its intent to harm. A fall of rocks blocked my direct path. The only choice left was a narrow passage to my right. I squeezed through, scraping against stone with harsh breaths echoing as the beasts pursued. Emerging into a smaller chamber, I found others, hikers like myself, frozen, eyes wide in terror as they too had stumbled upon this nightmare. Their names I never knew, as we shared no words, only collective fear. The creature burst through the passage behind me and lunged. Blood stained the ground. Screams filled the air. Sounds that would haunt the survivors forever if they made it out alive. In seconds it was over. Tamson lay lifeless among the others who had not been quick enough to flee. Their fates were sealed by chance alone, while others scrambled away in desperation. We emerged from the caves gasping for fresh air and sanity. Police arrived swiftly after our trembling fingers dialed emergency services from shaking phones. We could offer no explanation, only describe what we saw with stark horror etched in our expressions. An investigation found signs of a large carnivorous animal but concluded little else, no tracks to follow. Weeks passed. Life resumed its rhythm while we all bore scars, visible or not. The whispers about Sky Rim grew hushed with new respect or fear fueled by cruel experience rather than folklore, a story told in hushed tones about something primal and ruthless dwelling deep within the caves where light scarcely touched. We remembered those lost without names or faces, just haunting memories of a shared terror in those cursed caverns, and prayed none would be curious enough to challenge whatever resides within Sky Rim again. I had always been drawn to Salas, which is how I found myself spending the summer as a fire lookout in Monongahela National Forest, West Virginia. The isolation didn't bother me. I found peace in the quiet. My closest neighbor was miles of dense forest away, and for someone with no family and few friends like me, it was a perfect fit. My name is Corbin Gable and I have been living with the weight of my sister's disappearance from our hometown when we were children. 
The speculation around it had waned through the years, but not for me. This job was a needed retreat, a place to try and find some clarity amidst vast wilderness. The days lapsed into one another until that Thursday afternoon when I received the alarming report of a missing hiker near my tower. Incidents like these weren't unheard of. Many underestimated nature's indifference to human life. But this felt different. Search parties were formed, and I joined willingly, haunted by the ghost of my sister's unresolved fate. I remember we were looking for Callum Reed his unique name etched into my memory. The search lasted hours before someone shouted to draw our attention toward an all-too-still lake. The scene etched itself in my mind stark, brutal, the death unmistakable. But it was how Callum lay there, meticulously placed on the bank, none of his gear missing, not robbed or visibly attacked. What predator does this? Sleep became elusive after that day. Each night I stared out into blackness peppered with stars, searching for something lurking beyond my vision, an explanation as elusive as sleep. In conversation with townsfolk during supply runs, whispers reached my ears about recent disappearances, all laid out similarly to Callum Reed, untouched yet inexplicably dead. Some blamed a rogue animal. Others thought it was a deranged person replicating my sister's case, a series of crimes born from one long cold case. The following weeks strained my nerves taut. Reports came of found bodies, all men, similar age to me, displayed with unnerving precision. A sick ritual by a determined hand? Our deepest fear was that we were dealing with someone who took pleasure in morbid exhibitions. I couldn't shake off the cold grip of paranoia as twilight crept upon me one evening while returning to my tower late after supplying. A rustling followed by swift movement in the underbrush pulled me to an abrupt stop. Hard hammering against ribs felt poised to fracture under stress. I wasn't alone. There, amidst shadows walked something. No, someone. Tall and gaunt with a staggered but purposeful gait a hunter without snarl or fierce disposition, just silent determination. Jokes made among fellow lookouts about things in the woods now seemed like mocking echoes returned by sinister forms behind trees. How laughable our ignorance had been. The dread within me grew as this shadowed figure marched on unperturbed towards some destination unknown yet undoubtedly sinister in design. Another scene for us to find come morning? Heart racing, my steps hastened toward safety, a sprint from hidden prying eyes where rationality contended against what unsettled sensation clawed within, and all while knowing full well that whatever was out there might know where I reside. Panic surged. I reached my tower, slammed the door, and locked it. The radio crackled to life inside. I reached for it, pressed the transmit button, but stopped. Who would believe this? A creature stalking the woods? Without proof, they'd say stress had gotten to me. I set the radio down. The night grew quiet. The hours ticked by until light crept over the horizon. I ventured outside at dawn. Silence met me, no sign of the figure from last night. Days passed without incident until a scream shattered the still morning two days later. It was Mike, one of the lookouts from the west side. We ran to him and found what we feared, another body. Together, we decided action was necessary. We would not call the authorities. They'd ask why we hadn't sooner or scoff at tales of a creature. We would search for evidence. The search began at dusk. Mike stayed in his tower while I roamed cautiously near where I'd seen the figure. There, in a thicket, signs of struggle caught my eye. Disturbed earth and vegetation trampled flat in a large circle. Unease took hold as darkness fell. The figure emerged again, deliberate and silent, coming toward me. Its features became clear, 
tall, bony but with strength in its limbs, eyes that caught light but reflected nothing back. I ran back to my tower with it behind me, closer than before. In terror, I climbed faster and faster until I was high above ground once more. Mike's voice crackled through the radio. He saw it too, watching me from below with steady gaze. It wasn't human. We convened at sunrise, both shaken by our close encounter, in agreement that this menace lurked not from tales but flesh and blood yet beyond our understanding. We warned others discreetly. Words spread to avoid nightfall outdoors, to report any out occurrences immediately. No further loss occurred since that night. The creature's purpose remained a mystery. None dared to challenge its presence head-on for fear of becoming its next display. A lingering threat obscured by foliage and fear yet never grasped nor fully comprehended. In its wake left only questions. Why us? Why here? And who might fall victim before this enigma moves on, or is finally unveiled? The last body found was Paul. He'd gone out tracking elk alone. No one saw him leave nor knew where he had gone until they found him, a macabre art piece laid out at dawn's light. We mourned in our way, for the peace we lost and those who won't return. Each echo of snapped twigs or rustled leaves a reminder of what might still hide among twisted branches and shadowed paths. This is not folklore nor myth but a grisly truth lurking in plain sight. A predator among us marked only by death's design left for morning discovery. A tale none wished existed and many refused to accept even as they avoided starless skies and sounds beyond their sight. My name is Bartholomew Forrester, and a bizarre encounter led me to question the limits of reality. It all started after I moved to Pine Ridge, South Dakota following the end of my tumultuous marriage. Seeking solace in nature, I took long walks through the nearby Black Hills National Forest. Walking became a routine. One evening during a walk in the woods, I noticed unusual markings on the trees near the path. The scratches were too high to be pushed off as natural or caused by random wildlife. Unsettled but curious, I continued on. Days passed, and further into the forest, more signs emerged. The discovery of what seemed like a human tooth near a creek only heightened my suspicions. With these incidents in mind, I approached my reclusive neighbor Matilda Whitaker and told her about my findings. Can't trust these woods, she warned. Folks round here are hesitant to talk about it, but bad things happen out there. The rumors only fueled my curiosity. So one day when I picked up stranded hiker named Randall Schwartz, I couldn't restrain myself from asking him if he knew anything about these strange occurrences. I heard some talk about a creature from travelers who passed this way, Randall confided quietly. I ain't sure if it's truth or just local tall tales, best to be cautious out here. Undeterred by whispers of lurking danger, I remained determined to unravel the secret that Pine Ridge held close. Each day following any available lead, an odd noise heard by a local farmer here, chewed animal carcass there anything that could help construct a tangible picture of this mysterious threat. A week later, I spotted peculiar footprints while hiking deep in the woods. They did not belong to any common animal nor were they human, instead resembling some clawed fusion between man and beast. Following the trail with emergency flare gun at the ready, I came across Pine Grove, an abandoned campground. There, Tucked away in a large canvas tent, I found what appeared to be remnants of someone's possessions, clothes, shredded family photographs, and what looked like human hair. It was then that it dawned on me maybe we were dealing with a missing person. Returning to town, 
I decided to inform Pine Ridge Police Chief Harlan Espinoza. He listened carefully without interruption. When I finished my account, he responded solemnly. Sounds like we've got ourselves a pattern, said Harlan. He explained how over the past few months, four people had been reported missing, each one close to the woods after dusk. Due to lack of resources and clue on potential predators' true identity, they had remained tight-lipped. Let's take a look at what we've got so far, Harlan recounted, seemingly more comfortable with addressing the issue now that a fresh investigative lead had appeared. We went through each missing person case together, connecting similarities that would have seemed unrelated without the greater context. Realizing that trying to solve this mystery alone was naive and dangerous, we decided to team up with Randall, who revealed himself as an experienced hunter, when confronting this elusive creature head-on. When night fell once again in Black Hills National Forest, we set out with high-powered flashlights, emergency flare guns prepared for anything that crossed our path into the dark unknown. The air felt different that night as if charged with electricity. Tension gripped us tightly as silence reigned supreme while traversing deeper into darkness. It wasn't long before we found ourselves standing against enormous black shaggy fur covering some terrifying beast beneath its lustrous coat. Snarling viciously like some nightmarish hybrid of man and wolf, there stood before us what could only be described as a humanoid wolf creature towering over us with teeth bared and claws elongating menacingly on man-like hands. As we struggled to comprehend this monstrous aberration hellbent on evisceration, sudden gunfire cracks pierced through the dense air while muzzle flashes lit at the creature's location. The flare gun searing white light momentarily exposed the true magnitude of carnage incurred thus far. Bloody streaks marred the earth beneath our feet. The guttural snarls of the wolf-like creature were drowned out only by the vicious onslaught of gunfire from Randall's rifle. Shells ejected from the weapon like a rapid torrent of rain hitting the metal roof. But still, the beast persisted, its blood-soaked maw gnashing in a mixture of fury and agony. Can't you see it's not going down? I screamed to Randall, who was holding his ground against the seemingly invulnerable creature. As he continued firing, I clutched my flare gun tightly, sweating profusely despite the dark and eerie chill that engulfed us. With no other choice, I used my cell phone to call for help, my trembling hands almost dropping it as I dialed 911. As I hastily described our horrifying situation to the operator, Randall's rifle ceased fire, and I glanced over in sheer terror. I saw him quickly reloading his rifle when the creature lunged at him with an ear-splitting howl. The beast's sharp claws tore through his clothing and skin, leaving Randall writhing in unimaginable pain on the cold forest floor. Fear constricted my movements as I tried to help him, but all logic told me he couldn't be saved now. The best course of action would be to run and lead the nightmarish monster away from him. As Randall's screams echoed through the trees, I sprinted through the forest in a desperate attempt to escape and make it back to civilization. Every time I stumbled or tripped, my heart raced faster fear that this heinous creature had caught up to me. Finally exhausted and injured from my mad dash through uneven terrain, I found shelter in an old abandoned house deep within the woods. Gasping for breath and still clenching my flare gun tightly, I called 911 again to update them on our current situation, adding that Randall had been brutally attacked. Every creak and groan within the dilapidated structure heightened my anxiety as I waited in darkness for help to arrive. After what felt like an eternity, I finally heard the distant sound of sirens approaching our location. Illuminated by their red and blue flashing lights, my heart soared with hope, but I couldn't shake the sinking feeling that perhaps they were already too late for Randall. A forceful pounding on the worn wooden door startled me, 
followed by authoritative voices announcing their presence. With trembling hands, I unlocked the door, revealing a group of uniformed officers who questioned the situation briefly before leading me out of my temporary sanctuary. As we cautiously retraced my path back to where the fateful confrontation occurred, my heart raced with fearful anticipation. All that remained at the spot was the lifeless body of Randall, his flesh nearly shredded to pieces and his clothes torn apart. No sign of the wolf-like creature was seen anywhere. We hurried back to their vehicle, all aware that standing still in this forest now seemed more dangerous than ever. The officers spoke hurriedly amongst themselves, trying to figure out what kind of animal could kill Randall so brutally as they received orders to get back to their station as quickly as possible. Sitting in the back of a squad car, speeding away from that dark nightmare towards safety and a semblance of normalcy, my mind attempted to rationalize what I had just experienced. If only I could find a logical explanation for everything that had transpired tonight. But then again, rationale could never fully explain or justify what happened to Randall or those who had gone missing before us. What kind of animal out there possessed such savagery? That terrifying creature was beyond anything I'd ever witnessed in wildlife documentaries or any known scientific discoveries. My thoughts raced uncontrollably in a futile attempt to comprehend the beast we encountered. Was it some kind mutant wolf? A product of scientific experimentation? Or perhaps was it even a werewolf, like those whispered about in old folklores? Whatever the explanation, I knew there had been something lurking in Black Hills National Forest, something that had changed my life forever and left me with the memory of my friend's gruesome end. The only thing I knew for certain was that life would never be the same, and those eerie woods would continue to haunt my nightmares for many years to come. I stepped outside my apartment, feeling the fresh air on my face. My name's Jefferson Brinkley, and I work as a software developer. This morning jog feels like the only honest thing in my life. As I jog along the trail of Somber Woods Park in Idaho, I noticed a group of people gathered up ahead. Curiosity peaked. I slowed down to see what they were observing. It was a human body gruesomely dismembered beyond recognition. Instinctively, we all stepped back at once. Among the crowd was Maribel Graves, a young woman I barely knew but with whom I'd shared some amusing banter. Struggling for something to say, I muttered, Looks like someone had a bad day. She looked up from her phone and forced a smile. The police arrived promptly after the call for help was made. Their investigation started immediately, and the crowd dispersed quickly as none of us were keen to remain at such a disturbing scene. Days later, more missing persons reports began surfacing around town. Conversations at local bars revolved around this recent surge of crime and how it didn't seem related to any of our town's previous cases. Rumors grew louder when hunters claimed to have encountered an unidentifiable reptilian creature stalking its prey deep within somber woods. At first, people dismissed these stories as alcohol-fueled nonsense. But when one hunter turned up dead with similar wounds to the first body found in the park, our skepticism began to waver. Something sinister seemed to stalk our small town. A couple nights later, Mary Bell called me in a panic claiming she'd been attacked by something otherworldly in her own home. Wasting no time, I rushed over, my hand clutching the pepper spray I kept hidden in my pocket for emergencies. Inside her dimly lit house, Mary Bell explained that she had narrowly escaped the creature. I saw her door left wide open and her porch stained with dark, crimson droplets. She shuddered at the thought of what would have happened if she hadn't used the pepper spray. 
As we tried to make sense of her horrifying encounter, I noticed peculiar tracks that led from the front door into her once peaceful backyard. Clearly frightened, Maribel suggested we visit the local library in search of any possible answers. Together, we scoured old newspapers and town records for an explanation. We were soon captivated by a bizarre pattern. In each generation of our town's history, there had been similar crimes but with one distinct, tidy detail. The same reptilian creature motifs were present. Stressed and in need of comfort, we made our way to a bar hoping to share our findings with sympathetic ears. Instead, we were greeted with disbelief and condescending smirks from our fellow patrons. Maybe the town mascot's gotten loose, someone joked. Despite my frustration at their dismissal, I found myself chuckling. However, when the police presented images of the mysterious tracks taken near the crime scenes during a news conference, our community couldn't dismiss these incidents any longer. With no answers in sight, nerves throughout our town grew even more frayed. One day after attending a town hall meeting discussing safety precautions due to the current circumstances, Maribel and I decided to continue our conversation over dinner. It was refreshing to share a meal and confide in one another amidst such trying times. Despite the downtime at dinner, we couldn't avoid talking about the reptilian creature. We realized that we needed help and decided to contact local animal control in hopes they would capture the creature as quickly as possible. They agreed to investigate immediately. In the meantime, Mary Bell and I stayed with each other for safety. We tried our best to sleep through the night, but couldn't shake the feeling that we were being watched through our windows. The following evening, I discovered a news article reporting another attack with similar reptilian tracks found nearby. The attack occurred just two blocks from where we had been staying. Fearful of nightfall, we barricaded ourselves inside and called friends to extend their support as well as notifying local authorities about our findings. Suddenly, there was a loud crash at the back door. We froze in panic and then heard something pacing methodically outside. Frightened, we began desperately dialing friends and family for help. Someone finally picked up and agreed to come over as quickly as possible. While waiting, we heard the creature edging closer to our location within the house. The sound of its heavy breathing had us trembling in terror. It sounded like it wasn't alone. Moments later, our friends jolted open the door causing the creatures to scatter. We declared it was no longer safe to stay here. Law enforcement expedited efforts to apprehend this mysterious creature after learning of our encounter. The police dispatched a special team accompanied by scientists and zoologists who specialized in rare species. As they scouted our yard and town for signs of the reptilian creature, news broke out about more attacks around town, all with identical characteristics involving gore and gruesome injuries. Everyone in town kept a close eye on one another, avoiding nights out and creating neighborhood watch communities for overnight safety. As days went by without further attacks, people became hopeful that maybe the creature had finally retreated elsewhere. But our gut feeling told us it was still lurking. After a few more days of monitoring, the men who specialized in rare species discovered a nest hidden deep within the local woodlands. They found evidence of at least three creatures congregating in the area and decided to set up a trap to capture them. On the night of the trap, everyone stayed inside, watching the scene unfold on live television. The tension in town was palpable. The authorities soon trapped all three reptilian creatures by tempting them with bait. As they got close enough, heavy-duty nets were hurled over them, quickly immobilizing their movements. The creatures writhed and hissed fiercely under the restraints but were no match for the skilled team of professionals. Captured yet still unidentified, 
they appeared to be a blend of reptilian and alien-like features. The creatures had scaly skin with dark green hues and elongated limbs that enabled them to move with stealth and speed. Their eyes glinted yellow and emitted an unsettling gaze that sent chills down our spines. Once presumed safe, our town began returning to normalcy as each mauling victim was properly laid to rest. Nonetheless, we kept our guards up knowing what horrors still lurk about these woods. I found solace in knowing that Mary Bell and I had not only helped save future victims from these monstrous beings but also accomplished much-needed research for authorities who needed answers. The creatures now remain under observation by scientific experts seeking to unravel their origin and reason behind their persistent attacks throughout our town's history. In collaboration with zoologists from around the world, it's believed that these reptilian creatures belong to an unknown species that adapted throughout time in response to human presence and utilized their abilities as predators for survival purposes. With such remarkable discoveries being made, one can only wonder what more mysteries lie beneath the surface as our town's story finally came to an end. We may never truly understand why these creatures targeted us, but we can now begin to heal, cautiously anticipating what bizarre events may unfold next time our paths collide. I'd always been one to take shortcuts when running errands in my little town of Mullisburg. The sun was setting as I approached one such shortcut a rarely used path through the dense woods surrounding the town, known for its overgrown trails and secluded atmosphere. I'm Stanley Hillman, a physical therapist by day and a trivia enthusiast at the local bar by night. As a single man in my thirties, I led a relatively mundane life. I felt an odd chill in the air as I embarked on the narrow dirt path. A large oak tree had toppled over completely blocking my way forward. While standing there, figuring out my next move, I heard rustling within the thicket that grabbed my attention. A small group of people approached me, fear etched on their faces. A woman named Jennifer Patterson explained they'd stumbled upon evidence of a grisly murder deep within the woods and urged me to call the police immediately. Their phones were mysteriously drained of battery life. Nearby, we discovered a succession of missing persons posters stapled to an old tree trunk, denoting similar disappearances from neighboring towns. My skepticism grew, but something drove me to investigate further. The further we delved into the woods, the stranger it became. Sinister markings defaced trees and clusters of human belongings littered the ground. Unsettled yet relentlessly curious, we pressed on until finally stumbling upon a grim scene. A mutilated corpse lay at our feet. Thick streaks of dark crimson blood framed a gaping abdominal cavity that leaked viscera onto the forest floor. Though shaken to our cores, none of us could call for help. Something unseen and oppressive weighed heavily on us. An overwhelming, inexplicable terror that whispered unspoken commands to stay silent in our minds. As shadows deepened and night enveloped us, scraping sounds echoed through the undergrowth. We glimpsed flashes of scales amidst foliage, the trees trembling as if in fear. An otherworldly creature, reptilian in nature, emerged. Its cold, unblinking eyes glinted maliciously while its muscular tail undulated behind it. It radiated palpable malevolence a hunter whose ghastly design inspired dread in our very souls. Paralyzed for a moment, we locked eyes with the monstrous reptilian creature. The urge to call for help surged through us all, but we remained frozen in place, compelled by silent commands that implanted themselves in our minds. The creature slithered forward, razor-sharp fangs glistening in the moonlight, and my thoughts raced along with my heartbeat. We need to run! I choked out, breaking the eerie silence. 
The others seemed to snap out of their stupor simultaneously, and we took off sprinting in the opposite direction from which the creature had appeared. Branches whipped past our faces and roots tangled our feet, yet we continued running deeper into the dark woods. What do we do? How do we stop this thing? cried Jennifer as she tried to keep pace. I don't know, I responded desperately. We just have to find somewhere safe. The group stumbled upon a small cave that appeared relatively hidden from the forest path. Opting for safety over logic, we dove inside hoping it would spare us from the monstrous predator pursuing us. We can't stay in here forever, murmured one of our friends, sweat beating on his forehead. Yeah, but if we leave now... Jennifer's voice trailed off as our chances of survival seemed slim either way. Since calling for help was impossible while under this beast's oppressive influence, and none of us could explain how such an otherworldly being could even exist, I felt lost and afraid. Hours passed with only occasional scraping sounds and guttural growls lingering outside our hiding place. Morning arrived painfully slow, and with heavy reluctance, we grouped toward the cave entrance, exhausted but alive. Carefully peeking out into daylight's shield, there was no trace of the sinister reptilian creature. We decided to retreat back to civilization without further investigating what happened or why this being tormented us so viciously. Believing that the grisly murder and the abductions from neighboring towns were the work of this creature— we hesitated to share our experience as it was something unexplainable and horrifying. Before parting ways with Jennifer and the others, we dared to exchange our experiences only once, briefly. Together, under whispers, we agreed to never speak of it again or risk being called insane by those who hadn't witnessed the terror. It felt wrong to keep quiet about such a horror existing in our midst about the evil lurking within the woods nearby. But none of us wanted to subject ourselves to the ridicule that would undoubtedly follow if we divulged our encounter with the reptilian monster. It was a heavy burden to bear. The memories haunt me every day, a vivid flash of dark crimson blood, sulfur-scented air, and a beast with icy, merciless eyes. We moved on with our lives pretending it never happened, ignoring news stories about similar unexplained disappearances within nearby woods. There's a part of me, buried deep beneath my fear-riddled conscience, that believes this should have been my cause, seeking justice not only for those who needed closure but also for all of us forever scarred by our harrowing experience. It's a thin sliver in comparison to the black abyss housing my desire to flee from any memory associated with that fateful encounter. Regardless of these conflicting thoughts, I'll forever carry that night in my heart and tremble at any seemingly innocent scraping or rustling sound floating through an otherwise quiet backdrop. The fact remains, there is something terrifying out there, something that shouldn't exist but does a relentless hunter hiding in plain sight amidst peaceful settings, preying on humanity while we unknowingly go about our lives. As I lay awake tonight on what seems to be just another sleepless evening, I wonder, will this creature ever reveal itself again? And when it does, will we need to face it head-on, or slip back into the shadows? I drove down the winding road to my destination, the wooden cabin in the heart of Mendocino National Forest. The rattle of my truck engine always calmed me down after a long day at work. My name's Gideon Barkley, by the way. Grew up in a small town, working as an electrician. The cabin was my sanctuary, the same one that has belonged to our family for generations. It was weathered but sturdy. Inside were layers of dust and cobwebs testifying to all those years of memories. This weekend retreat was much needed, 
but I couldn't shake this strange feeling creeping up my spine. I stepped out of my truck and gathered the supplies from the back seat to last me for two days. The skies began turning darker, casting eerie shadows around. Silently, I chastised myself for being so jittery over nothing. Later that night, a sound woke me up. Leaves rustling? A muffled grunt? I strained to listen through the still air. Nothing. Must have been my imagination. The next morning, I found some deer tracks nearby leading to one of my property lines. Upon closer inspection, I saw that they were mixed with human tracks. I frowned but didn't pay it much mind. I knew some locals occasionally hunted near here. As I walked back inside, I turned on the radio looking for some distraction and maybe a good joke or two from the local stations. They never failed to make me laugh even if sometimes cringe at their humor. Once settled in for another night, as tiredness washed over me like a wave over pebbles on a shore I assumed it would be peaceful. Yet again, I jolted awake. This time it was unmistakable there was somebody out there. Quickly getting dressed, I tried calling 911 but couldn't get any signal this deep in the woods. Grabbing my shotgun, I opened the door and shouted, demanding to know who was out there. My heart beat drummed in my ears as I scanned the surrounding darkness for threats. The leaves rustled again this time closer followed by a blood-curdling growl. And then I saw it, gigantic, mangy, and unlike anything I had ever witnessed before. This creature towered over me with multi-layered teeth gaping out from its hideously deformed snout. My breathing faltered as I tried to make sense of what I was seeing. It lunged at me, those gruesome teeth aiming for my throat. Thankfully, instinct kicked in, and the creature's gnash narrowly missed me as I managed to step aside. Adrenaline coursed through my veins like an electrical storm. What are you? I yelled at the towering beast. But buckle-sized eyes glared back with only hunger and malice as it positioned itself to attack again. Time slowed down for what seemed like an eternity when suddenly a gunshot echoed from the distance. The creature flinched back in pain but continued undeterred. Running inside, I slammed the door shut, desperately searching for ways to barricade myself in the cabin. But the cabin was already being shaken by the roar of that monstrous intruder outside. Heart pounding, sweat dripping off my forehead as I stared at the door separating me from my attacker. The smell of iron permeated through my nostrils. How much blood had smeared into its grotesque fur during past victims. Suddenly there was a knock at the window. It was Marion Wellington, one of those rare neighbors that occasionally hunted by. She anxiously gestured toward her vehicle parked nearby and motioned for me to act quickly. Opening up the door just enough for me to slip through prepping myself mentally for whatever madness awaited another gunshot rang in painful proximity. Run! Marianne shouted. I'll cover you! The creature lunged toward me again. I sprinted toward Marianne's vehicle, heart pounding. She fired more shots, trying to hold the creature back. The beast snarled in pain but kept advancing. Reaching the vehicle, I scrambled inside. Marianne jumped into the driver's seat and slammed on the accelerator. We sped away, leaving the enraged creature behind. What was that thing? I asked between gasps for air. No idea, Marianne replied grimly, gripping the steering wheel. I've never seen anything like it before. We reached her house, a small but sturdy log cabin. A makeshift armory filled with hunting weapons lined one of the walls. Marianne got out her phone and dialed the police. It was our only option for help at this point. She tersely explained our situation and the dispatcher promised that officers would be dispatched to investigate as soon as possible. 
But Marianne and I both knew we couldn't rely on anyone else to save us from this nightmare. After ending the call, we double-checked the cabin's locks and barricades. While Marianne consulted her hunting books for any information about our monstrous pursuer, I grabbed a shotgun from her collection. What should we do now? I asked, holding my newfound weapon tightly. We'll wait for the police and keep alert. If that thing comes back, we'll be ready to fight, she said with determination. As hours crawled by, our fear hung heavy in the air, but there was no sign of the creature outside. Eventually, we heard sirens approaching. Relief washed over us as several police cars pulled up to the house. Officers took down our statements and searched the area around my cabin. They found evidence of struggle and suggested it might have been a bear attack gone awry, but they couldn't explain its monstrous appearance or relentless aggression toward us. Injured and exhausted, I let out a deep breath. We might have escaped this time, but I knew our lives would never be the same again. Thank you, Marianne, I told her sincerely. I wouldn't be alive if it wasn't for you. She nodded solemnly, before guiding the police officers out of her home. I went back inside, grateful to have someone on my side in this horrifying ordeal. Days later, Marianne came to visit me at my cabin while I was still recovering from the incident. She had been busy researching what that creature might have been and had a theory. I don't know for sure, but it could be a rogue predator, something that shouldn't exist. It might have been mutated or genetically engineered in some underground lab. The closest match is a bear, but bears don't hunt like that, and they certainly don't look like what we saw. Her words offered little comfort. I now lived in constant fear of the day when that beast would return. Marianne declared that she would keep searching for more information about this unknown predator and maybe even hunt it down so no one else would have to suffer like we did. We tried our best to return to our normal routines, but we both knew how foolish that was. Each day we left our homes, we were at risk of encountering that abomination again. As weeks turned into months, we did our best to move on from the horror of those events but we never forgot the sound of that creature's thunderous roars nor the sight of its gruesome teeth bared in hungry rage. Though our ordeal was over for now, the dark shadow it cast on our lives hung over us like a heavy burden. We knew this wasn't over, not by a long shot. In memory of those who fell victim to the beast's bloodlust before us, Marianne and I vowed to continue hunting down whatever it was that attacked us. Our search for answers and our quest for revenge had only just begun. And if, or when, that monster decided to resurface once more, we'd be ready to face it, guns blazing. I was looking forward to a peaceful weekend at the cabin, far away from the noise of the city. As I unloaded my groceries from the car, my neighbor, Ennis Weatherby, greeted me with a wave. Hey there, Caleb. Up for a bit of relaxation? Yeah, just needed a break from work, I replied, feeling a sense of freedom already settling in. We chatted for a moment about life and our shared love for escaping to these woods before he returned to his own cabin. Entering the cabin brought back fond memories of childhood with my family, and summers spent exploring the area. I cooked myself dinner before sitting on the porch to enjoy the sunset casting golden rays of light through the dense forest. The distinct aroma of pine filled my senses as evening approached. I had been engrossed in a book when I heard something that sounded like faint screams echoing through the woods. Curious. I walked towards the sound until I reached a clearing where I found Ennis lying on the ground, blood covering his hands. His wide-eyed expression shook me to my core as he mumbled, You need to booby-trap your place. 
It's coming for us, every generation. And then he lost consciousness. Alarmed but unsure of what he muttered about, I carried him back to his cabin and locked him inside. In any other circumstances, I would have called for help, but cell service was non-existent out here. Despite my fear, I knew that improvising some security measures might buy us time against whatever threat loomed. Next morning, while gathering materials for barricading both cabins, I spotted an ominous trail of blood leading away from where I'd found Ennis. Gripping my knife tightly, I decided to follow it. As I ventured further into the woods, the scent of decay assaulted my nostrils more intensely with each step. Suddenly, a rustle in the bushes sent a jolt of adrenaline through my body, and I turned to see a massive creature with razor-sharp claws and patches of matted fur. Its elongated snout, filled with crooked teeth, contorted into a sinister grin as its eyes locked onto mine. Panic seized me, and I sprinted back towards the cabins, determined to warn Ennis and fortify our defenses. Along the way, thoughts raced through my head. What was that creature? How could something like that even exist? When I reached Ennis's cabin, I frantically knocked on the door. He finally answered, his eyes reflecting terror upon hearing my story. As we fortified windows and barricaded doors, I mentioned setting up some bear traps around our properties. Throughout the process of setting up these defenses, Ennis told me about his grandfather who died under mysterious circumstances in these woods. The tales varied, but they all whispered about a creature that preyed upon those who wandered too far from safety. Nightfall brought no comfort as we took turns keeping watch from inside the cabin. We could only hope that our preparations would be enough to deter the beast. In a bizarre turn of events, we found dark humor in the situation as Ennis cracked a joke about how unfit it made us feel for staying in the city all these years. The hours dragged on with a suffocating tension hanging over us as we questioned every sound outside. Leaves crunching underfoot or branches snapping echoed like deafening explosions in our ears. As the night grew darker, we settled into an uneasy silence. Suddenly, a loud crash came from just outside the cabin. Ennis and I froze, gripping our makeshift weapons a hammer and a kitchen knife. We heard footsteps circling the cabin, and I tried to muster up the courage to call for help. But all I could do was whisper, Ennis, we should call someone. I managed to choke out. What good would that do? By the time they get here, it might be too late, he said with resignation. Our fear paralyzed us, and we succumbed to our helpless situation. We just listened as the creature outside dragged something heavy across the ground, accompanied by a wet, ripping sound. When daylight finally arrived, we hesitantly stepped outside to see what had transpired during those horrifying hours. We found claw marks etched across the outside walls of our cabins, but worse than that were the corpses of animals littering our property. It looked like a massacre had taken place. Among the carnage was an older man's body. Sneaking out from under the cover of his bedsheet revealed his mutilated face. It was Ennis's neighbor who lived close by. The recognition sent Ennis reeling back in shock and vomiting onto the ground. Despite feeling like my stomach turned to ice upon seeing that grotesque sight, I pulled myself together and dialed 911 on my phone. As expected, when the police arrived after what felt like an eternity, they were skeptical of our recount of last night's horrifying events. All they could do was remove the bodies and tell us an investigation would be conducted. Ennis grabbed me by the arm once they left. We can't stay here, he insisted. Let's just pack our belongings and leave. I nodded as we went back into our cabins to gather our things. As we worked quickly, we made plans to leave and never return to this place again. 
If its intention was to drive us away, then this vile creature had succeeded. With our vehicles loaded, one last glance around the property revealed something else, something we hadn't initially noticed. Hidden among the trees was a small wooden box, carved with intricate patterns, stained with dried blood. I decided to take it with me as we drove away. Maybe someone else could try to understand what had tormented us during our time there, and perhaps find a way to stop it. As we left the forest behind us with no desire to ever return, Ennis expressed gratitude for the fact that we hadn't become victims like his unfortunate neighbor. I offered a cold smile in response but couldn't help feeling that we were just lucky. Lucky and forever scarred. But four days later, luck abandoned me as well. While examining the contents of the box in the remote, yet safe cabin where we sought temporary refuge, I inadvertently knocked over a glass containing an unknown liquid. The fumes quickly consumed me before darkness settled in once more. As my vision blurred, I saw glimpses of the monstrous creature standing over me, and memories of that grotesque scene flashed before my eyes. Realization struck. This nightmare would not end simply by running from it. Desperation filled me as I felt those razor-sharp teeth closing in on my flesh, and I could only hope Ennis would have enough time to escape the wrath of the creature that haunted those woods. For myself? I didn't even have time to scream before everything went black. My name is Dale Howerton, and I've been a cop in Huntsville, Alabama for over a decade. I never really wanted to be anything else. My father was a cop, and his father before him was too. A tradition, I guess. Today started like any other day at work, with some paperwork and banter amongst the team. Something about Yolanda Montfort's dogs going on her neighbor's property again seemed funny at the time. We got a call in the late afternoon. There was an altercation at the local gas station. Apparently, someone found something out of place near the gas pumps. When we arrived on the scene, a small crowd had gathered around, some cracking jokes to ease the tension. Approaching the scene, we saw what all the fuss was about. There was blood everywhere. One of the pumps had been mangled and wrecked beyond recognition. It looked like an animal had come through and devoured whatever had caused this mess. My partner for the day, Kelly Dietrichson, spoke to one of the witnesses who mentioned hearing strange noises last night coming from the woods behind his house. We thanked him for his input but brushed it off as irrelevant. A young girl named Annette Sakalik suddenly cried out that her friend Nora Ingram was missing. Her voice shook with realized fear as she wondered if Nora had something to do with all that blood at the gas station. We decided to investigate further into Nora's disappearance and question her family that lived just outside of town towards where those strange noises were heard. Walking towards their house felt off somehow. It was uncomfortably quiet outside. As we made our way closer into those thick woods, Kelly called for backup but didn't get a response from dispatch. My cell phone wouldn't even work out here either. We seemed to be too far away from any signal tower in these woods. Nora Ingram's house stood silent, surrounded by looming trees casting shadows onto its weathered exterior. No one appeared to be home, but Kelly decided we should enter the house anyway. Upon entering, the house seemed normal and lovingly lived in. We called out for anyone inside, but our words were met with silence. We couldn't check every room safely without backup, so we decided to head back and wait. Kelly took a step off the porch when a crashing sound pierced the silence, shaking the ground beneath us. A creature emerged from the tree line. Its twisted form was like something out of a nightmare, dark, 
knotted flesh wrapped around its lanky body, and its skin stretched grotesquely over its long limbs. With shiny black eyes sunken into its oblong face, it stared hungrily at us. In an instant, I unholstered my weapon and started firing at the beast. To my horror, the bullets merely sunk into the creature's flesh with a sickening squelch as it continued forward, seemingly unaffected. Kelly followed suit with her own firearm while trying to radio for help once more. Aging static clouded her pleas for help as if this twisted monster was somehow disrupting our call to the outside world. The creature closed in on us with unnatural speed while we scrambled to find cover. Peering around a tree trunk, I gritted my teeth as I tried to formulate a plan amidst the chaos that had now gripped us in these solitary woods. It skulked towards Kelly's hiding place with horrifying precision as she continued firing recklessly at it. I called out for Kelly to run as I started sprinting towards her location. As I got closer, desperation took hold and I lunged at the abomination to try and pull it off its trajectory towards Kelly. Its skin felt cold and putrid under my grip as it twisted around with inhuman dexterity to face me. I wrestled with the creature, trying to grip its seemingly impenetrable flesh. Kelly took the opportunity to make her escape, shouting for help as she ran toward the cabin. I threw my weight against the creature, sending it crashing into a tree. I knew I couldn't defeat it, but maybe I could give Kelly enough time to lock herself in and find a way to contact help. I stumbled back towards the cabin but the creature was relentless. It dragged itself on all fours and closed in once again. Desperate, I shouted for Kelly to keep running and not look back. The terrifying sight of the beast's twisted body kept my instincts locked in survival mode as I sprinted further away from both the cabin and safety. Another deafening crash echoed through the woods. It was clear sensing our fear only fueled its bloodlust. As we continued our frantic chase through the forest, we came across a hunting trap, left by someone who had ventured into these woods before us. Driven by sheer adrenaline and panic, we attempted to use this forgotten relic against our pursuer. Hold it off! I shouted at Kelly while attempting to set the trap in place. Her gunshots continued as she provided cover fire. The creature lunged at me with gnashing teeth, but just as it thought it had me within its grasp, I shifted my weight and threw myself onto the floor, forcing it to change course and stumble onto the leaves surrounding the now-activated metal jaws. It screamed, a guttural sound that sent shivers down my spine, as it fell onto the trap's sharp teeth. The metallic clang resonated through the woods while its dark blood oozed around the tightening jaws. Screams resounded outside of our field of vision. Others had joined Kelly in her desperate call for help. By some miracle, assistance was not far away. An armed group of hikers had heard our cries and rushed to our aid. We could only watch as they valiantly fought to destroy the creature that nearly ended our lives. None of us dared to speak, attempting to process everything that had just occurred. Eventually, the creature was neutralized, its body charred and dismembered by a fire ignited in a controlled frenzy. Although it was difficult to believe, it seemed as though the nightmare was finally over. We banded together with those who had saved our lives and divulged the horrors we had faced. It didn't take long for speculations and analyses of this seemingly invincible creature to arise. Some guessed it might have been a mutated animal, others pondered whether bioengineering played a part in its grotesque existence. But nothing could be said with absolute certainty as theories continued being exchanged among disbelief-filled whispers. We soon turned our attention to the brave souls who paid the ultimate price battling this gruesome monstrosity. A solemn gathering assembled around a makeshift memorial, where each person shared fond memories of fallen comrades. 
The pain of loss brought forth from recognizing their absence weighed heavily on the mourners' hearts as they silently committed themselves to ensuring such a disaster would never happen again. Each person in attendance vowed in their hearts not to let those precious lives be lost in vain. As plans were made to ensure the safety of the forest and prevent anything similar from terrorizing its inhabitants once more, I further resolved that I too would contribute in some meaningful way. We would not forget what happened here nor would we cower in fear. For although we had faced an enemy unlike any other, through our trials and tribulations, we found strength and unity amidst chaos, proof that even when facing immeasurable odds, humanity remained undeterred and capable of triumphing against darkness time and time again. I now understood that while humankind may be vulnerable alone, together we possess an unwavering spirit unparalleled in determination and resilience, able to withstand even the most formidable threats. And as we stood together around the memorial, our silence a testament to both sorrow and resolve, I couldn't help but find solace amidst collective grief, a silver lining in the gruesome ordeal that fate had thrust upon us. This happened to me six years ago while working at the Mendocino National Forest in California. My name is Kester Anzaldo, and as a forest worker, my responsibilities included maintaining trails and preventing fire hazards. It was just another ordinary day at work until I stumbled upon something horrifying. While clearing some overgrown brush by the forest edge, I noticed several missing person posters nailed to trees victims of unsolved cases going back decades. A chill crept up my spine as I examined each one, realizing they had all disappeared within these woods. Only their faces were visible. Identifiable information like names and surnames had been scratched out. Why would someone do this? Unease started to settle in my stomach. Later that day, I confided in my co-worker, Ellery Silvera, about the posters. With a gravely serious tone, she said, You happened to stumble upon an old hunting ground. I asked her what she meant, but she dismissed it as a joke. As the sun dipped below the horizon, Ellery and I were wrapping up on sight when we heard blood-curdling screams in the distance. Without hesitation, we sprinted towards the sound. A figure emerged from the underbrush. It was our other co-worker Ashton Beale. His face was pale with terror as he panted out his story. He had witnessed a gruesome murder an unknown creature with unnatural speed committing the act before disappearing into the darkness. Unable to call for help due to our remote location and poor cell reception, we agreed that Ellery would stay with Ashton while I ran towards civilization to alert the authorities. During my hasty jog through the forest, harsh rustling sounds echoed from behind me too close for comfort. Speaking quietly into my walkie-talkie to remain unnoticed, I informed Ellery about my creepy pursuer. Then abruptly, her frantic voice crackled through. Kester, Ashton's gone. I never let go of him, but he just slipped out of my grasp as if as if he was pulled away by something much stronger. It suddenly became clear to me that something powerful was lurking in the dark, a creature we couldn't hope to comprehend or outrun. Just then, the rustling ceased. My heart pounded, and my surroundings seemed almost suffocating. Suddenly, a ferocious snarl came from the trees above. I looked up and saw an entity with blazing eyes and a razor-sharp grin that appeared to stretch impossibly wide. Its grotesque form was interwoven with shadow its edges flickering where the darkness met its body. I sprinted towards Ellery's location and found her shivering alone, holding Ashton's jacket. We can't stay here, I demanded. The creature could be back any moment. 
As we continued our seemingly endless journey towards safety, we recounted how many people must have met their fate in this lost corner of the forest. Painful thoughts flooded my mind. How would Ashton's family cope? Who would find out what happened to him? The harsh reality choked me with each passing second. Ellery and I sprinted through the dense forest, hearts pounding, and every twig we snapped felt like an invitation for the creature to follow. The air turned colder as we pushed onward, aware that our friend Ashton was in peril. We couldn't afford any hesitation or mistakes. We need help, Ellery gasped between breathless strides. We can't handle this on our own. Agreeing, I fumbled for my walkie-talkie with one hand while trying to maintain balance. I dialed the emergency channel and began to speak in a desperate plea for assistance. This is Kester, requesting immediate help. We're in the forest near Blackburn Ridge. There's something out here, a potential threat. Our friend has been taken. Please hurry. The seconds felt like hours as a static silence greeted me. Finally, a voice responded. Understood. Stay put, and don't worry. We'll send someone to your location right away. Ellery and I huddled next to a tree, still breathless from our escape and worried for Ashton's fate. A loud snap echoed through the darkness, followed by another ominous snarl from far off in the distance. Determined not to succumb to fear and abandoning any rational thought of waiting for help, we rushed towards the direction of the sound, but with caution, not wanting to alert the creature to our presence. As we continued through the forest, the snapping branches grew louder, so close now that my heart echoed in my ears. Just then, a low growl sounded nearby, followed by a pitiful whimper of pain, while we wanted nothing more than to run in terror, we steeled ourselves against this urge, aware that any cowardice now would only seal the fate of our captured friend. We found Ashton near a small clearing his face pale and twisted in agony as blood oozed from deep gashes across his chest. The creature coaxed another whimper from him as it gripped Ashton's arm tightly against his side. Seeing our friend in such a state sparked something within us. It was clear that the creature hadn't anticipated our arrival, and we seized the opportunity to enact a desperate plan. Ellery, now! I shouted, hoping fear alone would prompt action. Charging at the creature, Ellery hurled a large rock toward its head. As the stone connected, the creature let out a guttural cry, and released its grip on Ashton just long enough for me to drag him away to safety. The growls grew more enraged, and the creature seemed even more hell-bent on tearing apart anything within reach. That terrifying phase only confirmed we couldn't survive this fight. We needed help, and that aid was on its way. All we had to do was hang on until they arrived. We hardly paused to gauge our next move, instead dragging Ashton deeper into the heart of the forest as we stumbled over tangled roots and wet leaves, all senses alert for signs of pursuit. Our respite came soon after deafening sirens drowned out by every snapping twig behind us. When those first searchlights swept through the clearing, our nightmare began to recede. Officers swarmed around us as paramedics attended to Ashton's wounds. They assured us the creature would be hunted down, and that its reign of terror was finally over. In its wake, unanswered questions remained. What was that entity? How many had it claimed before us? As we sat numbly amongst the authorities who worked tirelessly to capture this resolute monster, another cold wind swept through the forest, chilling me right down to my marrow. Exhausted, Fatigued and with a heavy heart for Ashton's unspoken suffering, I could hardly muster a hint of relief as pieces of this puzzle continued to elude us. Where had this creature come from? What could stop it? And would we ever know if this nightmare had truly ended? Only one thing rang true. None of us would dare set foot in that dark, 
forsaken forest ever again. This happened to me a few summers ago, back when I still lived in the small town of Garrison, West Virginia. My name is Ezekiel Moore, and I was working as an electrician at the time. Like most people in town, I had a comfortable life, nothing too astounding. What stood apart was my love for hiking. One fine weekend morning, I decided to take a trek deep into the forest surrounding Garrison. As I walked deeper into the woods, I came across something that stopped me in my tracks, a brutally mutilated body. Immediately alarmed, I fumbled for my phone to dial emergency services but couldn't find any signal. Driven by my increasing sense of dread, I decided to cautiously press onward, hoping to find fellow hikers or some form of help. The path became increasingly narrow and twisted until eventually opening up into a tiny clearing surrounded by dense foliage. As luck would have it, I spotted another hiker, Roscoe Dubinsky. He appeared agitated and jumpy when we exchanged greetings. Roscoe revealed that he had also stumbled upon similar gruesome remains further back on the trail and had lost his two friends somewhere along the way. We agreed that it was safer for us to join forces and try to find help together. We hadn't gotten far before we heard strange rustling noises and heavy breathing in the bushes around us. Heart pounding, we broke into a frantic run trying to put as much distance as possible between ourselves and these unnatural sounds. Suddenly, we stumbled upon a lone cabin nestled between the trees a beacon of hope offering sanctuary from our nightmarish ordeal. The door hung open just enough for us to squeeze through. Once inside, we blocked it with a heavy wooden table. Exhausted and terrified, we tried our best to stifle our desperate panting as we scanned the dimly lit cabin for any signs of life or threat. Gradually adjusting to the darkness, our eyes caught on a grotesque figure standing in the corner. Tall, malnourished, and heavily scarred, the creature in front of us seemed more beast than man. Defying all logic, this monstrous being stood ominously, its disheveled hair partially obscuring a hollow and deeply unsettling gaze. Suddenly filled with a morbid curiosity, I wondered if this could be the cannibalistic mountain man rumored to inhabit these very forests. Unbeknownst to us, these chilling legends had cloaked a more sinister reality, a savage community of bloodthirsty hunters thriving away from civilization. In their insatiable quest for human prey, these cannibals relentlessly pursued unwary souls who strayed too far from Garrison's protective boundaries. Before we had a chance to react, the door we had barricaded opened just a crack again, and another creature slipped inside. This one had the same ghastly features as the first, but wielded a blood-stained gun in one hand with unnerving calm. Fear incapacitated us as we realized that these beasts were highly intelligent, perhaps even capable of planning and plotting against their victims with deadly precision. Just as our hope rapidly dwindled, I remembered Roscoe mentioning his lost friends. In the chaos of clawing their way through dense woods and stumbling upon evidence of their stalker's heinous appetites, his companions had become separated from him. Their horrible fate now seemed unavoidable. They were most likely dead or worse, being dragged back to whatever fetid lair these ruthless predators called home. As Roscoe whispered silent prayers for his friend's safety and swift release from torment, my mind raced feverishly searching for some way out of this nightmare that had engulfed us so completely. Our breaths hitched in unison as we heard yet another unsettling noise just outside the cabin door. This time it sounded like several pairs of feet dragging along the ground, accompanied by numerous sinister whispers and cruel laughter. With a sickening shudder, I realized that these fiends must have had others hunting us down, 
unseen and unheard until they were practically scratching at our doorstep. Roscoe and I, cornered and terrified, tried to think clearly despite our pounding hearts. The sinister laughter outside grew louder, the dragging footsteps nearing our fragile door. We knew calling for help would be futile. Our remote location meant any rescuers would arrive far too late. Desperate for an escape, we scanned the cabin for any remaining options. A small window caught my attention, possibly large enough for one person to squeeze through. It wasn't ideal, but we had no other choice. Roscoe, I whispered, we need to try that window before they get in here. It's now or never. With determination in his eyes, Roscoe nodded and moved swiftly toward the window while I kept watch by the door. The darkness outside enveloped him as he climbed through the narrow opening. Once he emerged on the other side, I followed suit. We landed on the cold ground outside, both of us panting and shivering from fear rather than temperatures. Listening for any signs of pursuit, we snuck through the darkness toward Garrison's protective boundaries. The cannibalistic mountain men seemed to split up and surround us. Their grotesque features appeared all around, stained teeth ripping into raw flesh, rancid breath clinging to nightmares. As Roscoe and I moved cautiously through the woods, we could hear them sneaking closer with every step. Suddenly, a deep growl erupted nearby. Instinctively, Roscoe pulled me behind a large tree as one of the monstrous hunters passed by within inches of us. His grotesque face was etched with malice, a twisted smile that sent shivers down my spine upon recognizing it as a man wearing someone else's skin as a mask, a trophy from some earlier kill. When the monster moved past us, still unaware of our presence, Roscoe and I took off running again. Our feet pounded against the ground while labored breaths tried to keep up. The creatures chased after us, their terrible laughter still ringing in our ears. Our fear turned into sheer panic as we realized they were hurting us deeper into their territory and further from safety. Despite an overwhelming urge to surrender, we pressed on, driven by hope that we might find Roscoe's friends, or at least some sign that they had made it out alive. As hours turned into days and days into a week, hope began fading. We discovered occasional traces left behind by Roscoe's friends, a scrap of clothing or a makeshift campsite, but nothing definitive to confirm their fate. We never stopped moving, always vigilant, always hiding. Throughout the ordeal, we met few other survivors who had wandered into this cursed territory while seeking shelter from the relentless predators. Together, we formed a ragtag group with one common goal, escape. At last, the day came when the chorus of sinister hunting calls abruptly ceased. The air felt pregnant with a sudden silence that had not graced our senses in far too long. As Roscoe and I locked eyes with newfound trust forged from shared trials, we unanimously decided to risk venturing out into the open. Together with our group of weary survivors, the ghosts of old memories accompanying our exodus, we stepped through Garrison's invisible boundary, leaving behind the brutal territory in which we had been hunted for what felt like an eternity. Roscoe mourned his lost friends silently as we emerged into a peaceful morning landscape free from our tormentor's reach. It took time for us all to recover from the trauma endured throughout those nightmarish days as victims of those bloodthirsty mountain men who stalked and preyed upon any unwitting soul who wandered into their realm. Life continued for us eventually, each day easier than the last though heartache lingered in each survivor's eyes, a heavy reminder of those who did not make it. Years have passed since our nightmarish experience with those monstrous hunters. And though we have reintegrated into society and moved on with our lives, Roscoe and I cannot forget the disturbing reality that somewhere out there in the darkness, 
those cannibalistic beings still seek their unsuspecting prey, unstoppable, relentless, and devoid of mercy. My name is Ezekiel Higgins, and I found myself deep in the heart of the Pine Barrens, New Jersey. As a member of a task force dedicated to hunting and tracking monsters, my life was far from ordinary. I inhaled the cool air, enjoying the earthy smell that it carried. The Pine Barrens span about 1.1 million acres, punctuated with dense forests, boggy swamps, and sandy soil that crunched underfoot as I followed the secret missions trail. Though a beautiful place to explore during daytime, these woods took on an eerie glow at night. I glanced at my partner on this mission. No signal here. Cassandra muttered, frustrated by her phone's unsuccessful attempt at finding a connection. It would be better to just shout for help. I couldn't help but agree with her deadpan humor. You remember that time on our trip to Yellowstone? In addition to my monster hunting career, I had genuinely shared some lighter moments with Cassandra, moments which made her relatable and often eased the tension when we were out on perilous missions. A gruesome scene interrupted our reminiscence. We stumbled upon what was left of Jeremy, missing since last week, and couldn't help but cringe at his charred remains. It seemed as if he had been consumed by fire from within. We hadn't seen anything like this before. As the days went by, we discovered more victims in similar conditions, burned beyond recognition and left to rot in the woods. The killings evolved our mission further. We had to find out who, or what, committed these horrific crimes. During our investigations, we would find peculiar footprints filled with rainwater, the prints were massive and beastly, but matched no known creature's anatomy. I've never seen tracks like these before, I said to Cassandra as she nervously chewed her pen's cap with furrowed brows. Our task force couldn't ignore the evidence any longer. Seeking assistance, we contacted an expert from the local university, Dr. Benedict Shepard, a man with an extensive background in zoology surveyed the tracks and victims with excited curiosity. Well, Dr. Shepard began, his voice measured and somber as he analyzed the site. These footprints undoubtedly belong to an unknown animalistic creature. As the days turned into weeks, we tracked the beast through miles of dense forest and moonlit swamps. The menacing quietness of our surroundings struck on a primal level and I found myself fighting an urge to vanish between trees or dive below swamp water to escape pursuit. It was then that our first contact with this creature happened. As we arrived at a derelict old cabin deep in the woods, it turned toward us, its eyes shining like reflective pools in the darkness. The villain had matted fur, sharp claws bigger than kitchen knives, and a broad silhouette that trembled with pent-up aggression. My heart raced as adrenaline surged through my veins. I finally understood fear at its core. This was no monster from a work of fiction, no werewolf or vampire, that could be stopped by any human weapon or ritual. It was raw animal instinct crafted into something horrifyingly perfect, an apex predator unknown to modern science. We held our breaths as this monstrous being circled us. I could feel a searing white-hot pain as it pierced through my shoulder with its razor-sharp claws. Cassandra quickly fired her gun at it, prompting it to retreat for a moment, only for it to launch forward once more with relentless hunger and rage evident in its movements. The creature roared savagely before diving back into the shadows. We realized that this menacing antagonist was not retreating but preparing its next cruel move on us or other innocents who had unknowingly wandered into its territory. We were running out of time, and our anxiety started to consume us. 
As the sun started to disappear behind the trees, we braced ourselves for another harrowing night hunting this elusive creature. Our desperate hope that the night would be the last one spent in fear continued to wane as we once again ventured into the sinister woods. Continuing our treacherous journey through the dark woods, we realized that we were deep in the territory of an unknown creature. Cassandra and I had no choice but to push forward, as the path behind us proved to be even more dangerous. We found ourselves navigating through a minefield of hidden pitfalls, our breaths coming in shallow, short gasps as we struggled to keep our bearings. The gnarling trees whispered eerie secrets and taunted us with warnings of impending doom. The forest itself almost seemed to cooperate with the monstrous being that hunted us. Dodging another shadowy attack from the creature's sharp claws, I couldn't help but notice the quickness of its movements, darting in and out as if it possessed some level of intelligence surpassing the average wild animal. More so, it seemed hell-bent on tormenting us instead of making a decisive killing blow. As we stumbled upon a clearing in the forest, the creature momentarily retreated into the darkness. Knowing our reprieve would be brief at best, we decided to split up and search for help. Cassandra would head for a nearby town with whatever speed her exhausted legs could muster while I stayed behind and fashioned makeshift weapons out of tree branches. The creature observed intently from the shadows as I desperately crafted crude tools. Seizing an opportunity during a fleeting moment when my guard was down, it lunged at me while letting out a gut-wrenching screech that defied its massive frame. Before I could defend myself, it grabbed my ankle and flung me across the clearing like a ragdoll. Seconds before losing consciousness, I noticed two figures approaching, park rangers who had been alerted by Cassandra's desperate pleas for help and must have been following her tracks. One swiftly attempted to intervene, pulling his sidearm while his companion tended to me. Through blurry vision and incomprehensible pain, I hazily saw an intense combat unfold. The park ranger managed to lodge a few rounds into the creature's thick hide and momentarily startled it. However, it quickly regained composure, retaliating with brute force and overpowering him in the process. Within moments, the creature crushed the park ranger by bringing its gargantuan claw down with enough force to shatter his ribcage. I could only watch helplessly as blood pooled around his lifeless remains, an outraging reminder of mankind's futile attempt to control the unknown depths of nature. The other ranger, after tending to my battered body, fired a flare gun into the sky. Panicked and disoriented, the creature retreated deeper into the forest. As if the flare had sent it an unyielding message of humanity's resilience, we could no longer hear its frightening howls in response. With every thud, hum, and whisper around us, the park ranger cautiously guided me back through the forest. My blood-soaked clothes stuck to my skin as my body reeked with sweat and fear. The image of that poor ranger laying lifeless in a pool of his own blood continued to plague my thoughts. As we finally emerged from the forest with our lives intact, albeit barely so, I found myself haunted by my encounter with that grotesque creature. It defied logic and known science, leaving behind only searing scars on my shoulder and unfathomable memories burned within my mind. I could only surmise that this enigmatic beast was a previously undiscovered species, one that had avoided human detection for years and now bore witness to our intrusion into its home. A living horror tale that defied imagination, a testament to nature's mysteries lurking beneath societal progress. Though we survived that harrowing encounter, there would always be an unspoken reminder of what was left behind— the life of an unyielding park ranger making his stand against overwhelming odds, a valiant sacrifice against an enemy he couldn't have possibly understood. 
His memory serves as a solemn reminder for those venturing into the unknown that there lurks something monstrous in even the darkest corners of our world. While my physical wounds will eventually heal, the residual terror from that gruesome attack will haunt me for the rest of my days, a grisly shadow forever cast upon my soul. I wiped the sweat from my brow, squinting at the vast expanse of forest that surrounded my Native American reservation. My name is Takoda Nayeli, not a common name, but it suited me. I have lived on this land for all my life, and today I'd planned to take a hike in the Cascade Mountains, Washington State. I never expected what would unfold during that hike. I took one last sip of water from my bottle before continuing deeper into the dense canopy. The Cascade Mountains were beautiful and serene, providing a perfect backdrop for my hiking adventure. Hey, Takoda! One of my friends shouted as he caught up with me. We exchanged a friendly grin, recognizing each other from our work on the reservation firefighting crew. Hey, Zenko! How's your day going? I asked casually. Not bad, he replied, taking a drag from his cigarette. Think about joining the firefighting team? It's pretty intense. We continued our conversation as we hiked deeper, unaware that soon we would witness something that would change our lives forever. We stumbled across a gruesome sight. Human remains scattered around an ancient burnt tree stump. The shock left us both staggered. We couldn't help but feel horrified and intrigued at the same time, wondering what could have caused such carnage. Before we could even contemplate calling for help, an eerie silence settled over us. I felt an unnerving presence lurking in the shadows just beyond our vision. Suddenly, from behind us emerged an enormous creature none of us had seen before nor heard about its existence. It resembled a wolf but was much larger and more terrifying than any wolf I had ever seen. Its fur was mottled with shades of black and gray, and its eyes glowed like burning embers. We froze in terror as the creature studied us with unsettling intelligence before turning away and disappearing back into the darkness of the woods. We tried calling for help, but the dense forest swallowed our cries, leaving us feeling isolated and helpless. This journey that began as a simple hike had now escalated into something far more dangerous. As fear and adrenaline coursed through our veins, we realized there was nobody to help us. We had to face this monster on our own. Knowing it was futile to run, we chose to stand our ground. We brandished whatever weapons we could find, makeshift clubs made from fallen branches and sharp rocks that peppered the forest floor. Then, without warning, the creature lunged at us with terrifying speed. I felt its teeth sink into my arm, hot pain flaring with each heartbeat. Zanko swung the club in a desperate attempt to save me from the beast's grip. We fought for what felt like an eternity, matching every move with all the strength we could muster. Narrowly avoiding a swipe of its lethal claws, I picked up a jagged stone and drove it deep into one of its glowing eyes. It howled in agony, an ear-piercing sound that would haunt me forever. Suddenly distracted by a familiar voice calling out for help somewhere in the distance, the creature hesitated. Seizing this opportunity, Zanko shouted a joke about its horrid appearance while I threw another rock at its wounded eye. And just like that, a seemingly endless battle came to an unexpected pause. The ferocious beast retreated back into the shadows. In the midst of the chaos, we tried to call for help again. But our voices were no match for the sounds of the thick forest. The creature's retreat was temporary and we knew it would return with a vengeance. After catching our breath, we exchanged a few hushed words. We decided it was time to leave this godforsaken forest 
and find our way back to civilization. The possibility of rescue seemed remote, and it was up to us to make our escape. As we slowly inched through the dense foliage, we heard the creature approaching from behind. Panic set in, and we found ourselves running blindly through the forest, cracking branches underfoot, stumbling over roots hidden beneath decomposing leaves, and gasping for air as if it were being squeezed out of our lungs. Out of nowhere, a ranger appeared on an ATV. He had been searching for us since hearing about our misadventure from some other hikers who had come across our abandoned backpacks earlier in the day. The creature charged at us once more but paused momentarily as it set its sights on the ranger. It sensed fresh prey, a more formidable opponent than two tired hikers. The ranger brandished his gun and unloaded several shots into the creature's abdomen. It screeched in agony and dropped to the ground, motionless. We clambered onto the ATV our bodies shaking from exhaustion and fear as we left the dead monster behind. In that moment, all rational thought was stripped away by a primal instinct to survive. We knew nothing about this beast, its origins or even if there might be more lurking nearby. While making our escape, I caught my reflection in one of the ATV's side mirrors, matted hair, dirt-spattered face, bruises adorning every exposed surface like gruesome reminders of what had happened here today. Upon reaching safety outside the forest's boundary line, police officers greeted us. The search for us had expanded into a full-scale rescue operation. They took our statements, but their expressions made it clear that they had difficulty believing our harrowing encounter with the creature. It was hard to fault them. It was all so unbelievable. Meanwhile, a team of wildlife experts and police officers ventured back into the forest to investigate the area and retrieve the creature's body. While we would never find out much about their findings, we heard whispers among them that this creature might be something entirely new. Some speculated it could be a mutated apex predator driven from its original habitat by deforestation or construction. We left town soon after, too shaken to stay near the place where we had nearly lost our lives. Zanko and I exchanged few words for the rest of the trip. There was no need. We had both lived through it and knew that neither time nor distance could entirely erase those memories. However, I took solace in one thought. We had survived, and our story would serve as a warning to others. The forest once seen as an escape from reality and a place of serenity, hid dangers beyond comprehension. In the end, our lives went on. Zanko moved to another city, finding solace and anonymity. I returned home to my job, but no matter how far away from that forest I went or how long it had been since it happened, the scars remained as proof of what transpired there. Over time, Stories circulated about other beings similar to the one we encountered in that forest, creatures lurking in the shadows of remote areas. It became a cautionary tale shared by campers sitting around their late-night fires, urging everyone to tread lightly on nature's doorstep. The creature's body remains a mystery, whether hidden deep within a government laboratory or lost in nature's endless cycle to be reborn again someday in another form. Yet its memory lingers like an indisputable reminder of the vast and often unknown world we coexist within. Thus, as I go about my daily life, I am ever mindful of what might be lurking just beyond the edge of my perception, unseen but undeniably real. And in that knowledge, I find an odd sense of comfort. Whatever the creature may have been that day, it was unmistakably part of this intricate, mysterious world that surrounds us. I remember it like it was yesterday. I was miles deep into the woods of Greenvale, 
a small town in the northeast of Alabama. Hunting has always been a way for me to escape the mundane corporate world I lived in, that same world where as a middle-aged divorcee, life had become increasingly monotonous. My name's Kyle Anderson, and today's hunt changed everything for me. My friends had dared me to come here despite hearing disturbing stories of missing hunters. Some said they were attacked by bears or got lost, while others claimed something far more sinister, a vicious creature called the Greenvale Stalker. But me, skeptical as ever, merely dismissed these tales as local campfire legends. This one morning found me tracking deer through the dense forest. My boots crunched over twigs and leaves quietly, each methodical step calculated to ensure stealth. It didn't take long before I found fresh tracks. A strong sense of excitement surged through my veins as I followed them deeper into the woods. Eventually, it happened. The unusual sound of a fawn squealing caught my ear like no other animal cry I'd ever heard before. In the blink of an eye, the sound ceased, and all was silent again. My heart pounded. This felt wrong. Wading through the increasingly dense overgrowth, my breath hitched when I stumbled upon something truly horrific, a scene straight out of someone's nightmares. A brutalized fawn lay dead on the ground before me, its body violently ripped open in a way that couldn't have been from any animal I'd encountered in decades of hunting. As repulsive as that sight was, nothing could have prepared me for what happened next. No more than twenty yards away was an animal unlike any other I'd seen before. Its grotesque form stood upright on two massively powerful legs that ended in hooves-like hands. Only thing was, they were dripping with blood. It was covered in coarse fur, its twisted face resembling a badly mutilated wolf. Yet this thing was way beyond mere beast. Teeth bared, its deep growl echoing menacingly through the trees. I slowly raised my rifle, hands trembling, watching its claws stretch out towards me. Time seemed to stand still as I aimed for the most vital part of the creature. My fingers clenched around the trigger before finally letting the bullet fly. A direct hit. The monstrous animal let out an enraged howl. Incredibly, despite the impact, it lunged towards me with unnerving speed, throwing my world into chaos as everything became a flurry of adrenaline-fueled action. I barely managed to dodge a swipe that would have surely torn me apart. Instead, it slashed across my arm, suddenly leaving a searing pain in its wake. There I was, wounded and cornered by an unimaginable nightmare. The terrifying realization hit me. Calling for help was useless. My friends who were miles away wouldn't hear me against the sounds of wind and rustling leaves. With a strange blend of terror and determination surging through my veins, I prepared for my final stand against what I had once dismissed as mere myth. Knowing that calling for help was useless, I quickly tried to think of a way to escape the creature's relentless pursuit. I glanced around, my eyes scanning for any means of escape. That's when I spotted my chance, a cluster of fallen trees not far ahead. If I could maneuver myself through the tangle of branches and trunks, perhaps I could hinder the progress of this abomination long enough to gain some distance. Taking shallow, rapid breaths, I sprinted towards the fallen trees while hearing the creature roar in fury behind me. As I approached the pile of timber— I leaped and scrambled as best as I could over the slippery branches, receiving countless cuts and splinters in my desperation. Miraculously, my plan seemed to work, at least temporarily. The creature struggled with its large form and powerful limbs to make its way through the same jumble wreckage that I had just hurriedly navigated through moments ago. It roared again in frustration as it swiped at the wooden barrier further entangling itself. Seizing this opportunity, I pressed onward without looking back. 
My heart pounded in my chest as painfully as my legs wrenched themselves forward, pushing me past what remained of my endurance. The creature's roars grew fainter until it was nothing but a ghostly echo amidst the forest. Exhausted beyond belief, there was no other choice but to rest for a moment. Collapsing against a tree trunk, breathing heavily from both fear and exertion, my eyes desperately searched for any signs that my nightmarish pursuer had returned. Thankfully there were none. Only silence answered me through the thick underbrush and tree trunks. Unsure if I'd ever feel safe again after this encounter with such an unimaginable horror, one thing was for sure, there would be no one who would believe what happened tonight. The monstrous creature from before appeared to have been a freak, an anomaly that I would likely never encounter again. It left me feeling irrational terror for the unknown lurking within the shadows of mundane reality. As I made my slow and painful journey back to the safety of civilization, reality gradually returned. Painful memories of the night's horrors played out in flashes before my mind's eye. Climbers and hikers often claimed to come across strange things in their explorations, but nothing could have prepared me for this wild, unnatural beast. I doubted anyone would ever believe my story if I tried to describe the creature. Even if they did, it might only bring unwanted attention to the very thing that I dearly hoped to avoid, encountering it ever again. I reached the gravel path leading back to the nearby town. My sense of normalcy increased as the distance between myself and the sight of my nightmarish ordeal widened. The following days were plagued with fear and uneasiness. The gnawing questions about what I had encountered relentlessly tortured me. While passing by a mirror one evening, something caught my eye, an ugly scar on my arm where the creature had sliced through flesh with a seemingly effortless swipe. Were it not for this permanent reminder of what had transpired, part of me would have preferred to convince myself that it all was just a fevered dream. I never told anyone around me about what happened during that night. There was no need for them to carry this burden themselves, no need for them to fill their lives with dread too. Instead, I went about my daily activities, work, home, socializing, becoming somewhat skilled at concealing the fear that still coursed through me on occasion. Yet each time I noticed a hint of something unnatural or unexplained, each time a lump formed hastily in my throat or my heart clenched suddenly under some oppressive emotion without reason, I couldn't help but recall that monstrous creature still roaming somewhere out there in the darkness. Within time, the memory of that encounter slowly faded, as do so many other things. But every now and then, when I find myself alone in the woods or a secluded place, I can't help but look out into the shadows, praying that nothing stares back. Some experiences leave one scarred for life, both physically and mentally. The terror I faced in that forest will forever be etched into my being, a reminder that the world, reality as we know it, still holds unspeakable horrors lurking just beyond our comprehension. This happened to me a few years back. Honestly, I'm never keen on going camping, but when your cousin invites you on a road trip through some of the national parks on the West Coast, it's tough to say no. Besides, he was bringing my best friend from middle school. Call me Jonas, by the way. I always wanted to travel like this for real, just pile in an RV and cruise down those iconic desert highways. I thought it would be an adventure filled with postcard-perfect scenery and late-night card games. You know, classic road trip stuff. Sequoia National Park was our first stop. It felt magical driving through tunnels cut into those trees so massive they dwarf human existence. We set up camp, rented out some hiking gear, and planned out a route across the backcountry, 
one with a couple of overnight stops along the way. Our destination was this lesser-known lake. Some local guy at the ranger's station hyped it up, said there were spectacular stargazing views. My cousin Zane thought it'd be fun, said a little adventure was good for us city folk. I wasn't so sure. Day one on the trail went fine. Some spectacular sights, maybe saw a bear from a distance. Even made friends with another young group of hikers heading the same way. That feeling of camaraderie among folks heading into the wild always gets me. Nights when things got unsettling. We had the campsite to ourselves. Fire blazing, we cracked open beers and swapped stories until all that was left was the sound of crickets and a rustling breeze. I remember the stars, a million of them, and thinking I didn't need that fancy lake after all. Morning was another matter. We found our supplies half gone, food containers ripped open, boots scattered by the stream. Our new hiker buddies had a similar scene back a mile where they'd camped. They said it must have been an animal, or some really inconsiderate campers who hadn't packed up properly. My friend, Emmett, seemed less convinced. He was the always be prepared, kind. Still, with nothing missing save those protein bars no one wanted anyway, we figured it was an isolated thing and pushed on. Night two? That's when I knew we had a problem. I woke up to a noise. We'd camped in a small clearing this time, a sliver of moon slicing through the pines. Someone, or something, was circling our tents. Every few paces, I'd hear it, the crunch of leaves, a branch snapping. This wasn't an animal. I could feel eyes on me, peering through the tent fabric. Panic woke up Zane and Emmett. I whispered that we needed to move now. Our friends from the first night bolted just as dawn lit up the sky. Zane wanted to go, find this person, whoever it was, confront them. I told him I wouldn't risk getting shot out there. In the back of my mind was a annoying question the others hadn't voiced. Why mess with our food but leave everything else, the expensive gear, wallets, phones? Nothing about scavenging seemed to fit. Zane was adamant then that we report it to the rangers. The station wasn't too far back on our route. We were halfway there when everything turned to chaos. Gunshot echoed through the trees, then screams, our hiker friends. All four of them ran from the woods, yelling they needed help. Another shot, another shout, then only two hikers returned, tears streaming. No time to explain, I yelled them into the RV, Emmett already behind the wheel. We tore down that dirt track like something was chasing us. Which, well, it may have been. It's strange because, in the rearview mirror, we didn't see anyone emerge from the forest. That, I think, is scarier than any gun-toting maniac. That silence, after what could have been murder. We alerted the rangers when we hit cell service. They looked at us like we had three heads, said no reports matched our story. I gave them detailed descriptions of our campsite, the direction of the shots, everything. Nothing. Eventually, Zane started wondering if I'd imagined it during some nightmare in the woods. The missing, or maybe dead, campers were never located. I haven't gone camping since, not out in the wilderness anyway. You might call me paranoid, but those rangers had seen this before. Look up those missing person statistics for national parks. Some don't have any explanation. It's never an animal, they always say. Sometimes I feel a prickle up my neck, like maybe I'm still somewhere out there in the woods, still being watched. It's a truth universally acknowledged. Behind each government facility's barbed wire lies secrets too murky for daylight. My name is Eustace Bambro, 
a scientist employed at one of those secluded United States research facilities, where the focus was on genetic experiments that toyed with nature's blueprint. The facility was nestled in the dense woodlands of the Pacific Northwest, far from prying eyes. On an ordinary morning that felt like any other, I punched in my code and heard the familiar beep as the lab door granted me access. My colleague, Dr. Castalia Henge, with a voracious love for crossword puzzles and an unfortunate proclivity toward accidental lab spills, greeted me with a distracted nod. Eustace, check this out. She handed me a petri dish with something amiss amidst our latest cultures. I spent hours peering through the microscope at cells behaving unlike anything I'd seen before. It was an anomaly both fascinating and unsettling. When Cass went on her coffee break, joking about how her caffeine levels were reaching critically low levels akin to our lab rats deprived of their rewards, I continued analyzing the sample. The peaceful monotony shattered when gruesome screams erupted from outside. Unhesitatingly, I locked the lab down, our protocol when potential contamination or danger is near. Cass should have done the same, but chaos has a way of numbing even well-trained minds. With my heart thundering against my chest, I could only think one thing. Whatever caused such terror would soon find its way here. Outside lay unnerving silence until twigs cracked methodically under decisive footsteps headed toward the facility. Through reinforced glass I caught a glimpse of something, off. It was humanoid but twisted with inhuman proportions, elongated limbs and sallow skin stretched taut over protruding bones. Backing away from the door, I clutched my issued firearm knowing its ineffectiveness against most things beyond flesh and blood. A voice crackled over the radio. Containment teams en route. Static filled the line before I could respond. That was Dak Aquilin's voice from security, never one to mince words yet always unnervingly calm amidst chaos. The creature found its way inside. How do you prepare to face something your mind refuses to comprehend fully? It destroyed doors as if they were made of cardboard and left destruction in its wake. Weapon ready but hands trembling, I tried to keep my breath quiet, not an easy feat when your survival instincts are screaming at you. We need to stick together. Dacca's voice came from seemingly nowhere as he emerged from behind overturned furniture. His gun pointed firmly ahead and eyes fierce with concentration despite a bloodied sleeve suggesting he'd had his own run-in with whatever was out here now turning research labs into hunting grounds. No kidding. I whispered back sharply but relieved someone else survived so far. Progressing cautiously through wreckage and unrecognizable debris that used to be scientific equipment, we attempted to formulate a plan. However, what confronted us defied all our logical strategies built on rationality and science. A piercing scream rent through the air, another victim claimed in this ungodly game of predator and prey. Dacker motioned me forward. We had to act not just survivors but saviors if anyone else remained alive. We moved through the corridors, fast but silent. Each corner we turned— Every door we passed, we expected the worst. We heard it before we saw it, heavy thuds, cracks, then a grunt. It was ahead of us. Dacker signaled to move back. We found refuge in a storage room. He shut the door gently, securing it with a metal rod through the handle. We can't fight this thing, he said, his voice low. I nodded in agreement. Holding my gun tight offered little comfort. A crash came close, too close, followed by silence. We both understood instantly. A crushing silence often bore cruel tidings. It's on top of us, I mouthed. The roof creaked above our heads. Suddenly, a gigantic limb plunged through the ceiling. It was thick, covered in scales resembling armor 
ending in three clawed digits that tore at the air blindly. It retracted quickly as more debris rained down on us. The creature was looking for movement. We stayed still until the silence returned. The absence of signal meant we couldn't call for help without revealing our position, a risk too great with that creature lurking just beyond sight. Our phones lay forgotten, possibly crushed underfoot or left behind during our initial escape. Eventually, night fell. Through tiny cracks in the storage room we noticed darkness creeping in to replace the fluorescent light outside. The creature seemed to quiet down with the darkness, or maybe it had moved to another part of the building. By morning, we couldn't hide any longer. Thirst and hunger drove us out of our cramped hiding spot. Creeping from our sanctuary revealed halls painted in red horror. Researchers and security personnel lay mauled beyond recognition, their lives ended by a creature straight from a nightmare book no one would ever want to read. Pulling ourselves away from the scenes of slaughter required focus we barely managed to muster. The exit sign offered a glimmer of hope. It hung crooked but pointed towards salvation nonetheless. Upon reaching what remained of the main entrance doors, daylight blinded us momentarily. Fresh air filled lungs accustomed to dust and fear. Outside we found more bodies but also saw life. Paramedics, police officers, soldiers surrounded what was once an esteemed research center now reduced to Carnage Central. They rushed towards us when they noticed we were escaping rather than attacking. Questions came at us like bullets as they led us away from that facility and its horrors within. What happened? Who or what did this? We couldn't offer them much. Fragments of memory didn't piece together well enough to form a coherent picture that could reveal what monster had haunted those hallways. Tests confirmed no pathogen was present, nothing infectious caused this disaster. The facility became quarantined regardless while soldiers geared up to move in, to face whatever had been unleashed or somehow found its way inside human territory. Onlookers muttered about terrorist bioweapons or genetic experiments gone awry. They wanted something rational to cling on to. But standing there among survivors and responders alike I knew that this carnage pointed towards something else, something older and far more primal than any modern weapon or man-made creation could ever be, a creature of immense power and brutality an apex predator not documented nor known by science until today, and even now only known by its bloody handiwork left behind on stainless steel and tiled floors alike. I always thought it was remarkable how a single decision could change your entire life, like deciding to become a long-haul trucker. My name's Malachi Trenton, and hauling cargo across the desolate stretches of the U.S. had always brought me serenity, a rare sentiment given my typically bustling routine. It was during one of these trips that my sense of peace was irrevocably shattered. Working a route that I'd driven countless times before, a sense of monotony hung in the air as I headed toward Beatty, a small, isolated town in Nevada sitting quietly at the outskirts of Death Valley. The town seemed frozen in time, with its rundown buildings casting long shadows in the dimming light. The cargo, a shipment of electronics, wasn't due until morning, so I planned to rest at Eddie's Motel an unremarkable two-story structure that had become my regular stopover. As I parked my rig in the vacant lot, I noticed another vehicle that certainly didn't belong to any local, a black sedan with tinted windows and out-of-state plates parked awkwardly close to the motel's side door. As I stepped out of the truck, I caught the lingering scent of burning rubber in the air. Something felt off but pinpointing it seemed elusive against the backdrop of such an ordinary setting. Life on the road teaches you to be cautious but not paranoid, skeptical but not afraid. 
so I locked up and headed to check-in. The motel clerk, Eustace Wampler, greeted me with his usual lackadaisical nod as he handed over my key. You've heard about those missing hitchhikers? He asked nonchalantly while flipping through an old magazine. Can't say I have, I replied while signing the log book. They're saying some fellas picking them off along Route 95. Eustace muttered before returning to reading, as if he'd said nothing more alarming than commenting on the weather. Chalking it up as local gossip, I made my way to room 12 and settled in for the night. There wasn't much else to do. Beatty lacked nightlife or any real entertainment for outsiders. My slumber was assaulted by screams piercing through the silence of pre-dawn hours. Heart racing but mind skeptical, I peered through my window blinds only to see that black sedan outside starting up hastily, its lights cutting through darkness. Something compelled me to investigate further. As daylight began edging over the horizon and casting a blood-orange hue across the sky, I cautiously approached where the sedan had been parked. There lay an overturned wallet belonging to someone named Gideon Straw, and next to it, disturbingly enough, were fresh streaks on the ground, a scene suggesting violence without presenting its victim. I knew then that despite every ounce of skepticism within me, something truly sinister occurred here last night. Questions swirled. Should I call for help? Who could possibly still be around? Panic didn't set in. Rather, curiosity mixed with ominous realization urged me ahead, as if unseen strings pulled me toward my truck's cab where radio signals could likely summon law enforcement despite Beatty's remote aura. I powered up my rig and reached for the CB radio mic but paused when noticing something lodged within the dashboard seams. Photos. Decorated with disturbing symbols rendered crudely in what appeared to be dried blood, an unmistakable signature from someone who wanted their deeds known yet reveled in anonymity. I took a step back, my grip tightened on the radio mic. The hesitation lingered. The photos and symbols spelled malice. Quiet settled heavy in the cab, pressing on my chest like the weight of unseen eyes watching. I decided against the call for help. Whoever left these images knew my truck, my place of refuge. Involving others might bring them harm, too. I put the truck into gear, aiming to reach Sheriff Link's office in town instead. Roads were empty, which granted relief yet spelled isolation. I drove with purpose, avoiding glances at the dashboard where the photos lay. Beatty streets came into view. Morning light barely stirred as I parked by the sheriff's station. No black sedan lurked in sight. Only Link's cruiser sat silent. Sheriff Link listened, brows knitted as I recounted events, and handed him Gideon Straw's wallet along with the disturbing photos. He ran a hand through his gray-streaked hair, concern clear in his furrowed face but words absent. Instead of solace... His silence bore gravity. Days folded into each other without news or break in routine until dusk gifted shadows long enough to hide figures and footsteps echoed closer than comfort allowed. Then he appeared, an outline first, materializing near the same spot where the sedan had been, a man, tall with broad shoulders bearing an air of controlled brutality. His face remained shadowed under streetlights bleeding pale yellow. That night echoed chaos without screams audible. Yet it was there, ripped clothing spread out on ground, signs of struggle sketched out on dusty roads now stained darker with every second that slipped past and footsteps outlined in dirt leading away from Beatty, away from safety. Sheriff Link found me next morning at daybreak outside my truck, trembling but alive with tales unwelcome in a sleepy place like Beatty. It happened again, I said as light breached sky's canvas. We waited for more signs, more victims, but days lingered quiet until one dawn-breaking morning Sheriff Link slumped over his desk amidst files and empty coffee cups, 
life drained out violently. He left behind a town forced to stare suspicion straight in its cold face, one that harbored sinister secrets once ignored in plain sight. In time names floated up, talk of a drifter passing through towns leaving traces of horror before desert roads claimed him back. Gideon Straw it could have been, if not just another lost soul succumbing to deserts that take more than they give back. Years may pass, details might fade, but echoes remain etched with those who vanished or lay found under dawn's blood-orange sky, their absence a constant presence in Beatty's calm disturbed too deeply to return untouched by violence witnessed that pre-dawn hour when screams tore silence and unwittingly turned witness to darkness disguised as an ordinary place. And all those who remain carry pieces of a puzzle incomplete, a reminder that some turmoil persists unseen until veils lift unexpectedly on streets too familiar to hide wounds inflicted by hands hidden no longer except by shadows fleeing lights reveal. This happened to me a few years ago. Looking back, the whole thing seems ridiculous, the type of tale you brush off with a nervous laugh in company. Of course, at the time, it was far from laughable. I'm a numbers guy, an engineer. Skepticism comes with the territory. Yet, even now, there are questions I can't answer, parts that just don't make sense. My buddy Corin has always been the outdoors a type. Fishing, hunting, you name it. He convinced me to take a summer weekend and go RV camping, just as two guys, some beers, and maybe a fish or two if we were lucky. Turns out he had a spot in mind, the Red Creek Reserve in Utah. Beautiful place. Remote. Not another soul in sight, the way Corin liked it. Red Creek is known for its red soil, a deep canyon running through it, and its old mines from the gold rush era. There's one big abandoned one that's supposed to be dangerous. Locals have their stories about that, of course. The first day was perfect, as perfect as you can ask for with only a tent and an RV parked at the canyon's rim. But somewhere on day two, I noticed something out of the corner of my eye. It was only a flash, the sun glinting off something down below. Then again, there was something moving further down in the canyon, just on the edge of the tree lean. Corin, you seeing this? I pointed, but he squinted with a shrug. Probably just a deer or something. His lack of concern emboldened me. Camera in hand. I decided to scramble down a short stretch of the slope for a better look. It wasn't wildlife, that much was clear. Too far off to really say for sure, but the figure looked large, humanoid. I scrambled back to the RV, feeling foolish for venturing down there alone. We joked about Bigfoot, about how ridiculous it all was. Yet something niggled at my rational mind. It wasn't a bear, the shape wasn't right. I had the strange feeling I was being watched. That night was odd. It wasn't exactly fear that kept me tossing and turning. It was that unsettling feeling, a low, prickly awareness that everything might not be as it seemed. I'd woken up once with the distinct sense I'd heard something shuffling just outside the RV. It was quiet enough out there that I should have heard an animal, but there was nothing. I convinced myself it was nerves getting the better of me. Day three is when everything shifted into the realm of nightmare. My name's Ellis, by the way. Ellis Pratt. It started, innocently enough, with Corin going on a morning fish down by the creek. Nothing much was biting, so he figured he'd try a spot further upstream told me he'd be back before lunch. That was the last time I saw him. At first, I wasn't concerned. Then the hours started dragging by. Lunch came and went. By mid-afternoon, 
I didn't know what to think. Maybe an accident? He told me the upstream path got rocky. A tumble, then lost in the trees? It sounded plausible. Until I came across the snap fishing rod beside the creek its end was splintered, the line cut jaggedly. It didn't look like someone breaking it in a fall. It was then I finally felt it, cold, crawling fear. That's when I got the hell out of there. Left my stuff in the RV, just sprinted back up the path. There was only one narrow road in and out of the reserve. There had to be other people at the trailhead. It was almost dark before I got there, chest heaving, heart pounding. I saw no one. My first panicked instinct was to keep running. Just get as far away from the place as possible. My rational brain wouldn't allow it. What about Corin? I sat in my car, staring into the darkening trees, every instinct screaming. That's when the police siren split the night. Turns out someone reported an abandoned RV matching mine. Routine check, they said. They took me back to the reserve, shown their flashlights around, asked questions. When daylight rolled around, a full-scale search party combed the whole area. Nothing. No Corin, no sign of struggle, no trace of another living thing. Nothing about his vanishing made sense. It was like he had disappeared into thin air. Then, maybe two weeks later, came the package. I came home to find it sitting on my porch, unmarked, no return address. Inside the package was Corin's battered camera, an SD card tucked next to the battery hatch. That night, hands shaking, I plugged it into my laptop. I wish I hadn't. There were photos and videos all from my friends last morning by the creek. Normal stuff at first, him adjusting his line, casting, some shots of the trees, then the change. It started with blurred images, as if the camera was bumped or jerked. Then it stabilized. Corin was running. No, not just running, fleeing in terror. Then the lens caught it for a split second, a man. I say man, but there was something, not quite right. Tall, freakishly so, like Corin was a toy compared to him. Pale skin, almost gray, hair a dark matted tangle. The rest of the video was just the camera tumbling on the ground, pointing up at the sky. Audio continued, though my friend's screams, horrible crunching sounds, then another sound, this low rasping laugh. Like nothing I've ever heard, human or otherwise. And then, abruptly, it cut out. Police took the camera. They checked. No signs of tampering. I described the man I saw, hesitantly. Of course, the officer gave me that half-pitying, half-concerned look. He thought I was losing it. Who can blame him? For months, it consumed me. Every shadow looked like him. Every creaking floorboard was his approaching step. Corin was never found. They eventually declared him legally dead. The official explanation? Animal attack. The thing is, there were two more cases in Red Creek since then. People vanishing without a trace. Always around that abandoned mine, it turns out. Locals talk now. It wasn't just stories from back in the day. That mine, something lives there. Whatever was out there snatched my friend, took the others. I couldn't tell them all I saw, not back then. People don't like to believe in impossible things. But you'll listen, right? Sometimes, late at night, I take out the camera and watch just the first moments of that video that first glimpse of something inhuman lurking in the trees. Some twisted part of me replays those sounds, trying to decipher another word behind the laughter. To me, it wasn't the sounds Corin made that were most haunting. It was the thing that ended them. There was amusement in that inhuman rasp, 
the amusement of a game well played. Maybe that's what it is to him, out there in the deep dark woods. Just a game. This year, I might go back to Red Creek. Alone. People will think I'm crazy, they'll try to stop me. I have to, though. To see if maybe, just maybe, there's more to find. Something on that video I missed. Or maybe not even on the video. I keep thinking back to that flash of movement the day before. The light glinting off something at the tree line. The last thing I want is proof, some bone to give them, evidence they can dismiss or deny. They won't get any of that from me. Corin didn't get a body to take home. All I want is some small thing to explain why it happened, an answer. I know, logically, it won't change anything. He's gone. But this, this gnawing uncertainty, this fear that somehow, he could have made it out there, could be alive and in need of help. If I find nothing, a clean ending to this twisted tale, that's what will finally finish me. Because if all these disappearances in the same small place are merely random acts of nature, then well, it seems the world is far darker and scarier than even a crazy tale of a lurking inhuman thing. My name is Kale, and I've never been one to scare easy. But what I witnessed while stationed in the fire lookout tower in Montana's remote Bitterroot National Forest shook my very foundation of reality. I still can't fully explain it, but I swear it's true, every word. I'd replaced an old-timer named Huxley. The guy needed a break after decades of solitude and endless sky. The change from city life to the thick silence of the forest was jarring, but welcome a place where my biggest worry should have been dry thunderstorms or rogue campfires. My routine was simple. Wake, watch, report, sleep. Rinse and repeat. I kept myself occupied with books and the occasional banter over the radio with nearby lookouts. Folks like Zara with her dry wit that made even bare warnings amusing. The isolation gnawed at me some nights, though. Missing were the city sounds, sirens, chatter, the soundtrack of my past life. But one evening, as dusk played with the treetops, something far worse than loneliness pierced that stillness. It began with a sound, a retching, wretched gurgling that defied natural logic. My radio crackled to life as Zara checked in, voice laced with panic. You hear that? Tell me you hear that, too, she gasped out. That mutual recognition rooted me to the spot. Deciding to investigate was my first mistake. Acting against reason and protocol, I descended from my watchtower towards the sound. It seemed crucial to sate this invasive curiosity. Through the thickening gloom, shapes melded with shadows. Trees could have been specters for all I cared. Yet there was something else amid them, an impossible contour that moved not like any bear or mountain cat but with a jerky unease that made my stomach lurch. Canvassing a small clearing exposed to moonlit scrutiny revealed remnants of what could only be described as a shallow bloodbath, a grisly sight indeed but showcased no evidence of who or what had fallen victim to such violence. The prospect of turning back hung heavy on my mind but like a moth beckoned by an open flame, through flickering horror and confusion, I pressed on, towards abomination. Movement flickered at the edge of vision. Tangible dread spilled into every crevice of thought as a form materialized, a natural yet wholly unnatural sight amongst the timberland fauna. The creature, or man it might once have been, moved awkwardly through undergrowth with barely restrained violence visible in every sinewy motion. It wasn't its silhouette that chilled me most. It was its complete lack of sound where there should have been snapping twigs underfoot or labored breaths cutting through crisp air, 
all hallmarks of living beings traversing dense woods. A brief glance towards its form etched in my mind's eye an image of depravity. Rag clothes hung loosely from its frame as pallid skin stretched thin across jagged bones. Perhaps these few seconds dampened its meticulous efforts for quietness because now it knew, an observer witnessed its existence within these acres reserved for trees and wildlife alone. Retreating steps should have followed next, terror dictating common sense at long last overriding morbid fascination. But we both stood motionless amidst nature's locked gaze, a voyeur exposed and monstrosity acknowledged in untamed terrain where man is an outlier at best. I hesitated. The shape took notice and charged. Bared teeth, nails like knives, it lunged. I turned and ran, not looking back, my breast heavy. Through the woods, my phone lost signal. I wanted to call for help. No service. Footsteps pounded behind me. Help! I screamed as I stumbled into a road. A truck stopped. Its driver pulled me in, asked no questions, and sped off. The creature halted at the forest edge, eyes glaring from the darkness. Sirens rang in the distance as we drove away. In the rearview mirror, the ghastly figure retreated into the shadows. Safe now, I spoke to police about the clearing, the blood, the chase. They listened and shared glances of concern, but said nothing of similar cases or answers. Days later, news broke of a lost hiker found, unrecognizable injuries, cause unknown. Survivors lamented. Whispers of an unspeakable terror lurking were left unconfirmed. Investigators scoured the woods while I could only wonder about that night, the reality of my escape, and whose fate twisted for my deliverance. The memory lingered as I walked city streets under broad daylight, forever aware that somewhere out there moved an assailant unexplained by man or myth, a silent predator in a world not quite ours alone. I had just finished my evening meal, a simple recipe I learned from my mother, when I heard a knock at the door. My name is Wilfred Kipling, and I've been living in this old, cozy cabin in the heart of Brackendale Forest, Washington, for three years now. At the door stood a man. His name was Thurston Abernathy, and I knew him as the local police chief. He looked distressed. Wilfred! he said. There have been reports about something strange happening in the woods. Two people have gone missing in the area. What do you want me to do, Thurston? I asked. Join our search party tonight, he replied. Your knowledge of these woods may come handy. So we met at the edge of the forest at around nine in the evening. Our group included Thurston, Deputy Ariella Grantley, a park ranger named Declan Lockwood, and me. As we set off into the woods, we chatted to keep ourselves occupied. Ariella mentioned her family back home in Kentucky and how much she loved her nieces and nephews. The further we ventured into Brackendale Forest, the darker it grew. Eventually, we couldn't help but feel an eerie sensation envelop us, as if something wasn't quite right. Suddenly we stumbled upon something unusual, a torn piece of clothing hanging from a tree branch. A little further ahead there lay a shoe with what appeared like claw marks on it. We continued cautiously when suddenly Declan saw something large crouched near a tree trunk ahead of us. He held his flashlight to get a better look, tall with broad shoulders, covered in thick matted fur and piercing red eyes that seemed to glow menacingly. The creature abruptly charged towards us with incredible speed and strength that left us all petrified. Thurston fired his gun at it but missed, causing the creature to shriek in rage before it disappeared back into the darkness. D did you see that? Declan stuttered. What was that thing? 
our hearts raced, but we couldn't abandon the search for the missing people now. With our guns at the ready, we ventured deeper into the woods, hoping for more clues without encountering the ghastly creature again. Hours passed with no luck, and Thurston decided to split us into pairs. He took Declan with him, while Ariella and I remained together. That thing was no ordinary animal. Ariella began but stopped when she noticed something ahead. We discovered another shoe, but this time blood stained the ground around it. As we followed a trail of blood and clothes, we heard someone gagging. We discovered Melanie Stenson, one of the missing persons, unconscious and brutally attacked. I held her head in my lap as Ariella radioed for help. As we waited for assistance through what seemed like an eternity, the rustling leaves grew louder. I felt an uncanny presence all around us. Suddenly, the savage creature emerged again, standing on its hind legs and bearing its razor-sharp claws. Ariella fired her gun on impulse as it lunged into the air toward us. It leaped aside just in time to avoid her shot and take cover within nearby bushes. We need to get out of here, Ariella said as suspense towered over us like a dark cloud. We picked up Melanie with immense care and proceeded through treacherous woods with this terrifying entity relentlessly stalking us every step of the way. Ready to defend ourselves at any moment, we carefully navigated our way forward with Melanie cradled in our arms while listening to hallowed rasps of restive breath invading our eardrums from afar. As Melanie lay in my lap, barely conscious, I could see the concern on Ariella's face. Keep an eye on Melanie. I'll try to find a way out of here. She told me as she stepped towards a small clearing further ahead. We knew we couldn't stay in one place for too long out with that creature following us. But Melanie was in no condition to move on her own. With each passing minute, a sense of urgency grew within me to find a way out of these woods. Soon after, Ariella found a narrow path leading to what seemed like the direction of our vehicles. A glimmer of hope arose within us. We carried Melanie as gently as possible while maintaining our pace, knowing it was quite literally a matter of life and death. As we moved along the path, the creature didn't let up. It continued stalking us, hiding just beyond our line of sight. The rustling of the leaves and snapping twigs were constant reminders that it could attack at any moment. Every now and then, it made its presence known by growling loudly from the dense forest surrounding us. Although we couldn't clearly see it in those fleeting moments, we got glimpses of its appearance. Large, muscular, and covered in dark fur with elongated limbs that seemed unnatural for any known animal species. We began hearing faint sounds not far from where we were heading help must be close. This motivated us to pick up our pace even more, ignoring the throbbing pain in our arms from carrying Melanie. We were desperate to reach safety before it was too late. As we neared the edge of the woods, Relief washed over us as we saw police cars and ambulances stationed in the distance. However, our relief was short-lived when suddenly the monstrous creature lunged at us with full force. It came incredibly close to hitting Melanie, swiping its razor-sharp claws just inches away from her, but Ariella managed to push Melanie and me out of harm's way. It was only a momentary dodge— but it bought us enough time to make a mad dash to the safety of the authorities. Once we were in the clear, I glanced back and saw the creature staring at us from the edge of the woods, its deep-set eyes locked onto ours. There was something unnervingly intelligent behind those eyes that seemed unnatural for any predator. With the paramedics attending to Melanie and police gathering statements from us, we knew that it wasn't safe for anyone unless that creature was stopped. Despite our exhaustion, Ariella and I insisted on joining a search team assembled by the authorities along with Thurston and Declan, who had managed to reach safety earlier. With firearms ready, 
we cautiously approached the woods where we had last seen the creature. It had become eerily quiet. The sense of being watched was overwhelming. Suddenly, a horrible screeching sound echoed through the trees as the unimaginable happened. The beast ambushed one of our team members. The scene was gruesome. The lifeless body of Officer Barnes lay on the ground as blood pooled around him. The creature had disappeared again. In silence, we carried Barnes' body back to where our search began. The suffocating feeling hadn't left us. We knew that terrifying beast was not finished with us yet. Once proper authorities have dealt with the creature in a more professional manner, Ariella and I were called back and along with Thurston to give our accounts of what had transpired within those woods. We provided descriptions of this seemingly impossible foe leaving out no grisly detail about its appearance or its haunting gaze. The authorities began piecing together an explanation despite having never witnessed anything quite like this before. They came up with theories about possible undiscovered subspecies or maybe even a cruel experiment gone awry. A couple of days later, with the woods now declared off-limits to the public, further searches revealed the remains of at least three more people. Among those identified was James Crawford, another one of the missing persons. The thought of how close we were to meeting the same fate as those poor souls never truly left me or Ariella. And while I feel grateful for having survived, the haunting memories will forever linger in our minds a reminder that there are things out there that defy comprehension.